Good evening, and welcome to the Select Board meeting for Monday, June 21st, 2021. This is Steve DeCourcy, Select Board Chair. The Commonwealth passed last Thursday an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, which among other things, allows public meetings to be conducted remotely until April of 2022. However, tonight's meeting of the board is being conducted in person in the select board chambers and town hall for the first time since March 9th, 2020. The meeting is also being simulcast online in interest of providing additional access and piloting hybrid meeting technologies. I have three additional notes before we begin the meeting. First, as the first in-person meeting conducted by this board in well over a year, and in light of continued vaccination efforts, we have reduced the seating capacity for the select board chamber to provide greater social distancing for persons who are required to be physically present or wish to observe the proceedings in person. We respectfully request that those in-person attendees waiting for the business item on the agenda wait in the larger, higher capacity Lions Hearings Room where this meeting will be simulcast. When it's your turn, or if you'd like to comment on an agenda item, please enter the chamber for your business and exit when you have finished. Furthermore, we respectfully ask that all non-vaccinated persons wear a mask while they are in town hall. Second, board member Len Diggins is participating remotely this evening, consistent with remote participation guidelines for board members. As such, all business will be conducted by roll call vote, similar to the manner in which we would conduct our, me our meetings via Zoom. Third, while this meeting is being conducted in person, it is also available via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. And further, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. And during public hearings and the open forum period, I will first call upon persons physically present in town hall and then afford public comment or open forum to persons joining the meeting by Zoom. We will promote Zoom participants one at a time and we'll be able to see and hear them on screens set up in the select board chamber as Mr. Diggins and other members of the public observe online. Finally, both Zoom participants and people watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. With that, all the members of the board other than Mr. Diggins are here are, as our town manager, Adam Chapdelaine, town council, Douglas Heim, and board administrator, Ashley Marr. Um, this time I'd like to invite all the members to introduce themselves, so starting with Mr. Hurd. John Hurd. I'm Diane Mahan. I'm Eric Helmuth. Adam Chapdelaine, Town Manager. Doug Hunt, Town Council. Ashley Marr, Slack Board's Office. And, and as I said, Mr. Diggins is participating remotely. Please. Thank you. Okay, and before we start, I do want to thank ACMI, members of our IT department, Deputy Town Manager Jim Feeney, Ashley Marr and Lauren Costa from our office. Um, there has been a tremendous amount of work to get us to this stage to run a hybrid meeting and we're grateful for all the work that they have done uh, to get us to this point. Um, so the next item on the agenda is a letter of appreciation for Howard Muse, Chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee. Mr. Muse is here this evening. Um, unfortunately, we had this scheduled for earlier in the month, but because of uh, difficulties with weather, we had to cancel it, and the rescheduled date was actually a meeting of the Transportation Advisory Committee. So I'm gonna read the letter and then open it up to comments from the board and then allow Mr. Muse to, to address this as well. And, and Mr. Muse has announced that um, he will be leaving the TAC as of June 30th. He started in August of 2005, and as a board, we wanted to send him a letter of appreciation uh, that I'll read now. Uh, Dear Mr. Muse, the select board would like to offer you its most sincere thanks for your years of service to the Arlington Transportation Advisory Committee as a member, co-chair, and chair. Your volunteer efforts have provided innumerable benefits to the town and its transportation network and the entire town 
owes you a debt of gratitude. As you well know, you began your volunteer service as an associate member of the TAC in August 2005. You became a full member in June 2006, became vice chair in 2010. You then advanced to the position of co-chair in 2011 and served as chair from 2015 until June 2021. Along with other TAC members, you were awarded the Arlington Volunteer of the Year Award in 2007. You've provided strong leadership, technical support, and community engagement to the TAC for many years. Your accomplishments have included many sensitive and complex issues and projects, such as East Arlington Mass Ave redesign, Arlington Center parking improvements, Arlington Center safe travel project, Lake Street and Minuteman bikeway improvements, the new Arlington High School, the Mugar redevelopment project, Chestnut Street safety improvements, which I think we may hear from you a little bit on that tonight, many smaller projects involving multimodal mobility, accessibility, and safety improvements. You've led the TAC through a changing transportation environment, and your efforts have improved transportation safety and mobility for Arlington residents, school children, businesses, employees, and visitors of all ages and abilities. Thank you for your dedicated years of volunteer service to the town of Arlington from the board. I would like to call on other members of the board and one of the, um, Mr. Diggins has involved, been involved in the Transportation Advisory Committee, so I'd like to call on him first. Hey, Mr. Chair, I'm going to plug in my headphones and so I hope you hear myself. Um, so, um, I have, ever since I've been on the um, TAC, representing the Chamber of Congress on behalf of ACMI, uh, Mr. Hughes has been the, um, the chair, and he's been very well me and, and always very knowledgeable. But more importantly, he's been very calm, because as we'll see there on the, on the agenda, <laughs> there are lots of topics that come before the tax that he already got at and he care about them a lot. And I'll just add one more thing. He, it says everything about this abuse that he joined as a, um, as a, a I can't get the term for it right now. Uh, but uh, before he was able to vote, he, he was a member of, of TAC. He, and people who really care about committees he, are the ones who tend to join in that way. Because as we, as often say to folks, he, it's not so important that you have a vote, but that you have a voice. He, and Arlington is very good about providing means for people to have a voice at the, at the table. So uh, I really appreciate everything that is Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. And I, I do, again, want to thank Howard for his years of service. I also used to be the Chamber of Commerce re representative briefly on the TAC, and I served with Howard, I think, in your transition from co-chair to full chair. And I, I think sometimes people don't understand how much work it takes when you're on the TAC because there's a couple meetings or a meeting a month, but there's a lot of work on top of that because what we, every month we send new traffic issues to the TAC to explore and then it takes hours and hours of time actually out in the field exploring those issues and coming up with recommendations and solutions. So I do thank you and all the TAC members for all the work that you put in. And I know, and often on the subcommittees, H Muse is usually listed on the TAC website, so they got to put the expertise where it's needed. So um, again, thank you for your years and years of service, and uh, good luck as you move forward. You'll certainly be missed. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you. Um, I have to say this is kind of bittersweet um, because how valuable you, as well as your colleagues um, on the Transportation Advisory Committee, but especially you know, starting out in 2005, as Mr. Diggins Lynn said, as an associate member. Um, and the other thing that I really credit you with um, in large part is most people in town who A, know what TAC is, they know what that acronym is for, they frequently say, you know, can you send this over to TAC so they can resolve this? 
um, to most residents and or businesses in the town, you are viewed as an official department working for the town, but you're not compensated, so you're working for the community <laughs> and the businesses. Um, and I really have, have, have watched it, the TAC Transportation Advisory Committee, really transition um, under your leadership tutelage, but also um, the credentials that you have, as well as every other member previously and currently on TAC. I, I often say the town couldn't, couldn't probably afford your services. I mean, you, you and the committee members, um, you know, when we say we refer something to TAC, um, a lot of people don't realize unless they call one of the members of the board and said, hey, I saw three people out there and they, they had something and the strip was across the road and, you know, what, and I say, oh, it's transportation. Oh, can I get them down there to do that for me too? So, um, and really, I know this board has endeavored uh, currently in previous boards to really try to save some things and not send it to Transportation Advisory Committee because of the people hours um, that you all dedicate to it. So to Howard, we're gonna hear from you later on tonight because you're still working on the clock, <laughs> volunteer. Um, I, I do wanna wish you well, good health, my sincere thanks, but also say I feel so sorry to lose you. I know you're not going away, you will be around, but you certainly paid your dues um, and you're one of the architectural roots of our current day TAC, and for that I'm truly grateful. Thank you, Mrs. Mott. Mr. Helm. Thank you. One of the first things you learn when you get involved in town government is how important TAC is and how much the select board relies on that body to make really important decisions that have really big implications. And everything I've heard from my colleagues tonight just reinforces what I've heard for years that this is one of the best committees in town. And it's clear to me from hearing Steve's letter that a lot of that has to do with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmut. And, and I just want to echo from, from the letter and from the comments, it, it just, in my time on the board, when we got a difficult issue that was going to attack, we always knew it was going to be reviewed thoughtfully, it was going to be reviewed thoroughly. And uh, when you made presentations, they're always top notch, and we really appreciate that over the years. So, if you'd like to say a few words, um, go right ahead. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you for all the wonderful comments. I do want to say that it's been a pleasure on my part to serve on the committee, and also a privilege because I think the committee does do a lot of good things for the town. Um, and one of the things I would stress is how supportive I think everyone on TAC feels that the board has been. Uh, it's, it's just, we always feel welcome here when we're bringing recommendations in, even if they might be somewhat controversial with residents or uh, businesses. So it's uh, been quite an experience. Uh, if I could just correct one thing, I'm not out of the tact just yet. Okay. I'm no longer chair. Uh, Laura Swan, who's the um, school committee representative, has taken over the chairmanship. And I'm going to stay on the committee for a couple of months to help with the transition. Well, that's great news. <laughs> thank, 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 thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming in tonight. And uh, again, thank you for your work. And we'll see you a little later in the year. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Next item is the recognition of the Mugar Homeless Outreach Team. I believe they're outside the chamber. They may be coming in now. There will be some delays as we as we have different agenda items and uh, we go through the evening. And, uh, Mr. Dunnett said it earlier in the year that select board will be the lab for, for learning in the uh, hybrid environment. Um, so we just wait for a moment for everybody to come in. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, with us tonight are Arlington Patrol Officer Joseph Kniff and Hannah O'Halloran, a social worker from the Somerville Homeless Coalition. Uh, we asked them to come here to the meeting this evening so that we could recognize and thank each of them for their work on the multidisciplinary Arlington Homeless Outreach Team. We also want to recognize Officer Kniff for actions he took on June 2nd in the Mugar Woods. Uh, on that day, at approximately 9.30 a.m., Officer Kniff was conducting weekly outreach efforts along with Ms. O'Halloran when a verbal altercation began between two homeless men at the site. Following the initial altercation, one of the men returned and demanded that a gun be returned to him. A homeless woman who had been staying at the site then handed the man what was believed to be a rifle. At that point, the man became aggressive and began to charge toward Officer Kniff while brandishing the gun at him. Through de-escalation efforts, Officer Kniff was successful in persuading the man to drop the gun, which was later identified as a BB pellet gun. Other officers responded to the scene to provide assistance to Officer Kniff. Through his actions, Officer Kniff de-escalated the situation and prevented any injury, not only to the suspect, who has since been charged with assault, and others in the area, but to Officer Kniff himself. In recognizing Officer Kniff's actions, Chief Flaherty, who is with us tonight, said in part, the actions of Officer Kniff are consistent with the highest standards of law enforcement and public safety. Faced with a split-second decision and a weapon pointed in his direction with a suspect coming towards him in the woods, Officer Kniff remained calm and fell back on his training to de-escalate a volatile and potentially dangerous situation. As a board, we want to commend Officer Kniff for his actions on June 2nd. We also want to commend Ms. O'Halloran, who was with Officer Kniff and assisted him during this encounter. Thank you both very much. Thank you, and thank you both for coming in. Uh, Ms. O'Halloran, thank you for your efforts that day. I know it's a really tense situation. And um, that day, and also everything that you do in the Mugar Woods, I know that the Somerville Homeless Coalition has been an integral partner for us in, uh, in dealing with, in helping the homeless population in Arlington, and the outreach that you guys have done has just been invaluable. Mike Libby lives down the street from me, so I'll be sure to make sure I pass on my thanks on your behalf to him as well. And Officer Kniff, thank you so much for the work you've done. That day, I, we talked about this last meeting, me and a couple members of the board attended the training, for, uh, for that the de-escalation training that, at the Arlington Police Station. And the tenseness of these simulated situations is so overwhelming that I, can, I couldn't imagine what it's actually like in the field when someone brandishes a weapon that you, for all intents and purposes, would assume was a real loaded firearm. So this is just another example of the incredible community policing efforts that we do in town from the chief on down. And it's, it, we always tell people that even with everything going on, around the country. We want people to look at the Arlington Police Department and say this is how police departments should act. And this is an example of this. I think this is a, another example that people in Arlington should look to and really start acknowledging the incredible work of the Arlington Police Department and being thankful that we have officers like Officer Kniff who are watching over us under Chief Flaherty. So I really want to thank you for your efforts both that day and also, anyone that has kids knows Officer Kenneth. He's great with kids. My boys always go up and see him. He always laughs because my younger one day is a fireman, one day is a policeman, one day is a fireman. He'll be an astronaut. He's always like, be a policeman. And then I know he's also been caught on tape showing off some uh, sweet dance moves from time to time. So he's a multi talented, incredible officer from incredible parents who I know very well as, as well. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you both for coming in, and it's much appreciated. Thank you, sir. Mrs. Mahan. Um, first, sincerely, I, I hope you're both okay. 
Um, I know you trained for this through the police department, through the Somerville Homeless Coalition, but it's a lot different in real life. Um, similar to what Mr. Hurd said, um, pre, you know, prior times, I remember going to the de-escalation long trailer and people, fellow police off, not fellow, I'm not a police officer, police officers told me it's really intense. And I'm like, how intense can it get in a huge trailer that I know I'm safe in? And we went in, then members of the board, as current members did, and stood alongside and viewed. It's amazing how quickly you get pulled in to that situation. And I remember thinking, I got a breeze right here. <laughs> because I, I, you, and so that's in a trailer where I'm safe. Um, you all were out there. Um, it, it, one of the things I, I have been and will continue to be is so extremely proud and grateful of our Arlington Police Department, men and women on the force, all the way down to administrative personnel, and especially the Somerville Homeless Coalition. I know there are so many times I've called upon you, especially during COVID-19, with Arlington residents um, who sometimes got, were asked to leave their homes and literally were homeless. And um, I'm not gonna say any of the names because there's privacy and that's the other thing. A lot of people don't know what the police department through Officer Kniff and, and the Somerville Homeless Co Coalition, um, how many people they help and what some of those homeless Arlington residents look like. You know, they're members of our community that we could find ourselves in the same circumstance. Um, so again, um, I don't think we thank you enough. <laughs> um, the Homeless Coalition, as well as the Arlington Police Department. Um, you have, especially through 2019 pandemic, a new group in town that I'm not even gonna dignify by even saying their acronym, um, that really have tried to um, discredit and speak untruths um, about what happens you know, here in Arlington, whether it's through the police force or through the Somerville Homeless Coalition. And I'm so glad that um, this is just one instance that we're speaking about publicly. I could probably speak about seven, and you all know who, <laughs> who the top one is I'm talking about um, and the service you provide. And lastly, I'd say to both your families, thank you so much for your sacrifice. Because uh, I know it's a sacrifice. I know it's the worrying having police officers and firefighters in my family. And it's also the sacrifice that you're willing to commit to your son, daughter, spouse, friend, that they're going out there and they're not thinking of their safety first. And that's a really hard thing to do. And that's a testament to this incident here. They're thinking, how can I gain control of this situation, de-escalate it to a safe resolution, and make sure this person gets home, gets the help they need. And then they think, and so I go home to my family and loved ones. So um, a lot of people don't, you know, people say that, um, but when you live it, you really do live it. Um, so you should put yourself first, but you don't. So thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. DeCourcy, for highlighting this. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's not easy to stand there in the front of the microphone. I've done it a lot. Um, so it means a lot that you would do that. And your service to the community, both of you, means a great deal. Uh, the work you do is hard. And the fact that you do this to help the individuals um, in the homeless community um, and the extraordinary courage and care that you both showed during that very stressful incident speaks volumes about who you are, your compassion, your skill, and your values. And I am grateful to you and this community is grateful. You both represent in the most outstanding way possible community policing in Arlington with its model of partnership between the police and mental health clinicians and social work clinicians. I, I, I know I can see that you're proud of that, and, and you should be. I'm really proud of that. I'm, I'm grateful for the leadership in the town. It, as, as Selectman Heard said, that comes from the top down through the, through the chief, and it's clear to me that you've internalized that, and that's why that day ended well. Uh, thank you again for serving us so well. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, you know, one of, one of the things I want uh, at this point in the rotation is that uh, all the things that I was given said is so 
I really want to express my appreciation, but I also say that the first time gave that I joined the Internet Officer Smith was when I went to help with the cleanup uh, of New Garden Woods in, uh, back in late April. It was very clear how dedicated he was, but also, um, as, as I mentioned, the criminal homeless coalition. Uh, that was a different experience, David, and, and um, I didn't mention it again a lot of the time because I didn't want seem like in the least eh, that I was talking about myself, eh, but but uh, I would say that the dedication eh, uh, uh, to the people, the police department, to everyone in the community uh, is, 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 is wonderful, it's great, um, it's what we come to expect, and I've gotten to know a uh, number of officers um, from, from um, Ted and Jim, eh, uh, they're, they're all just really good guys, and so to a certain extent I'm not surprised um, that um, this has happened, um, and that's a good thing, but nonetheless, we are very appreciative. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. And, and before I ask if you want to say a few words, I, I just want to speak briefly about the partnership between the police department and the Salvo Homeless Coalition, because I, I've seen Joe and Hannah working at, at Newgar Woods. We've had, been at neighborhood meetings. Um, I've been there at the cleanups and see the work you do, the work that you do together, and, and the outstanding services that you provide. And, and Hannah, I, I want to say specifically, to you, you are very good, excellent at what you do. And, and I've seen you out there doing the work, in, in, and I know you get that up every week, and, and it's outstanding service. I know it's been, it was difficult, and, and uh, you know, we're here to support you, and we support what you're doing. And, and, and for, for you, Joe, same thing. I, I see what you do, how you communicate both with the neighbors and the people who are in, in the woods, and, and your commitment to your profession and to providing services. So thank you so much for that. So if you've heard at home, there's a little noise in the background. That's a proud daughter. Nora Knipp right. is, is right. with us here yeah. in, in, in the back to see her dad. Um, just wondering if either one of you would like to say anything. Sure. Um, I just, first of all, I want to express how grateful I am for our collaboration with the Southern Homeless Coalition. Um, Hannah is an extreme asset to the town of Arlington. I know you, some of you have seen her in work, and she is simply amazing at what she does. Um, and I can't thank her enough, not only for our friendship, but for being part of the team. So thank you very much. I also wanted to say thank you to Chief Flaherty um, for the training that we've received. Um, training is crucial, continuous training. Um, and I'm very grateful to work in the department that supports us for that. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I would say that when I first started outreaching in the Mugar Woods, I was very against ever outreaching with police officers because at times it can be very detrimental um, to our relationship. But I think the way that Arlington Police is trained, it's probably the best um, trained officers that I've ever interacted with. And I work across a, a number of communities in the area. And I'm unbelievably grateful to have been partnered with Joe, um, especially on that day. So thank you for giving me him. <laughs> Thank, thank you both so much. I just want to extend another thank you. I'm going to be checking your Facebook page, Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you all. We'll take Nora home now. Bye. <laughs> bye, Nora. Bye, bye. Josh. Excuse me. The next item on the the agenda is a Prince Hall Day proclamation listed as a resolution. We had moved approval of a recommendation to town meeting and, and a declaration of Prince Hall Day for. June 24th. At the time we took our vote earlier in the year, the proclamation was not complete. Um, so the final version was presented to town meeting. We did present it at the Prince Hall uh, Cemetery on Memorial Day. But the fact that now that we're back in the chamber and, and Prince Hall Day is later this week, that we would um, read the proclamation and have a confirmatory vote on the day. I believe there, there are members of the, um, from the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts in Dorchester who we will promote um, onto the Zoom. And then I will, I will read the proclamation and ask for a vote. Mr. 
Chairman. Would, would you like us to promote the original proponent of the resolution, yeah, Ms. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that as well. And, and I also want to recognize uh, Beth Malachuk, who had brought the resolution to us originally. Um, she actually reached out to me this afternoon, and we corrected a small administrative issue. And, um, so I appreciate her doing that, and uh, we'll allow both of them to, both groups to be promoted here, and then we will read the, the proclamation. There's also the Prince Hall Grain Lodge. Yes. In, in, in addition, before we, in addition to, we, recommended this by a five to zero vote. Town meeting recommended it unanimously uh, for the consent agenda. Uh, and once we get the final, they promoted They are there, yes. Okay, great, all right. Thank you very much. Um, so good evening, thank you, Ms. Malavchuk. I'm now going to read the proclamation. Whereas Prince Hall was a revolutionary war era black leader, community leader, and abolitionist in Boston, and believed to have fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill, and whereas Prince Hall served as one of the United States' first civil rights leaders, petitioning the General Court on January 13, 1777, for the abolition of slavery, and in so doing, was the first American to publicly use the language of the Declaration of Independence for political purposes other than justifying war against Britain and advocating for education as an inalienable right central to the advancement of all peoples. And whereas Prince Hall founded the first black Freemason Lodge in the United States, African Lodge Number no. 1 in 1777, and served as its Grand Master, employing such position as a Freemason to advance civil rights interests of black people throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And whereas of the many rights and privileges Prince Hall endeavored to secure, was the rights of black Freemasons prior to obtaining their charter was to walk on St. John's Day, June 24th of each year. And whereas 20 years after the final founding of the African Lodge No. 1, Prince Hall offered a charge delivered to the African Lodge at Mononymy on June 24th, 1797. And Mononymy being the historic predecessor to the town of Arlington and portions of the city of Cambridge. And whereas in 1864, the Grand Master of the Prince Hall Freemasons deeded land on Gardner Street in Arlington for the establishment of the Prince Hall Cemetery for the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Boston, recognized in part through the historic preservation efforts of the Arlington Historical Society and the Town of Arlington on the National Register of Historical Places. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Arlington Select Board declares June 24th Prince Hall Day throughout the town of Arlington, celebrating the life and legacy of this founding father and civil rights leader. And be it further resolved that the town of Arlington, Arlington Public Schools, and the broader Arlington community is encouraged to develop programs and events to inform the public of the life, achievements, and contributions of Prince Hall. To turn to the board for a motion on this. Any comments? Mr. Mr. Approval. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Helmer? Thank you. I'd like to move approval. And uh, it was. Second uh, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear yeah. that. Yeah, okay. yes. uh, move approval. And I'd just like to say, um, second, that um, it, it was a real privilege to, to be there on Memorial Day and meet many members of the lodge and to sing, lift every voice and sing uh, with you all. And uh, it was a great day. We are honored by your presence, and it's really wonderful to be able to, to um, and if I finalize could, this. Could, Mr. Chair, just brief comments. Um, I want to um, thank everyone, uh, as well as the um, African Lodge Number no. One, um, who are overseers uh, of Prince Hall, as well as um, the Freemasons, um, who also are caretakers down there. Um, and I'm so glad we're doing this. Um, I wish we did it. 30, 40 years ago, because I'm 58, and I lived in, we called it the projects then, but now it's in Monotomy Manor, and we moved from different buildings. But when I lived on Gardner Street, I remember going by 
Prince Hall Cemetery. And it was a <clears throat> not 100% well kept. And I remember I was a senior in high school and I went to my teacher's history department and asked about the Prince Hall Cemetery and nobody really knew. Uh, and I also worked as a page at Robbins Library and I tried to find reference material. Back then it's Dewey Decimal System and uh, looking for the actual books. Couldn't find anything on it. Um, and finally, Eleanor Kantrowitz, who is the um, head librarian, God rest her soul. She had historical anecdotal information of what she knew, but she did not know at all. Um, and I remember thinking back then, you know, it's really um, an overlooked, not only jewel, but opportunity. Um, I know the town has lots of things to do, long way to go, um, and we're all committed to do that. But I, I've always said, especially around history, um, that's really one of the top echelons of Arlington, which was West Cambridge, which was Monotomy. Uh, and I don't think not only do we promote our historical um, stories here in Arlington, we don't learn about and educate enough. Um, and I'd like to, you know, the Town Day Committee, we incorporated David Lansom Way and try every year to get the information out about that. Another um, great black American um, during the Revolutionary War that this is such a wonderful historical story behind that. So um, I want to uh, thank everybody, um, Ms. Malofchek, for bringing this to town meeting. Um, I and my colleagues will certainly follow through on our end, but I also agree our colleagues on the school committee who I also heard agreement, um, as well as perhaps through library services, through the town manager. Um, look at, you know, David Lansom Way, Prince Hall, and, and other areas in town that we don't know about and we should. And um, we work to endeavor um, to speak those stories just as loudly as some of the more well-known ones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Diggins. Thanks, Chair. And uh, I am happy that we are celebrating the fourth to make the um, to the fourth um, Prince Holiday. And I appreciate uh, being educated about um, Prince Hall uh, and all that he's done. And I tend to be one that looks forward sometimes. Way forward. Uh, uh, and so it's not surprising often when I don't know a lot of historical um, people and places, but I um, delight when I am educated in them about them myself. And so um, I, I have to say that second whereas, though, is the one that I really appreciate uh, because uh, the towards the end of it, it says advocating for education as an inalienable right uh, central to the advancement of all peoples. And I couldn't agree with that more. Uh, and and uh, thanks to people like Prince Hall and lots of other people of, of all races that have helped me out so much uh, during my life that I was able to get a good education that's made all the difference. And, and I think the one thing that we can do to really prove that this proclamation means a lot, means something to us, is to make sure that everyone uh, gets an education. And yes, it costs money to do that, uh, but we as a society really need to do that. So I hope we will do that. And thank you once again. Mr. Hurt. Yep. And I also like to echo my colleagues' comments. Thank Ms. Malofshek for bringing this really important cause to the forefront in Arlington this year. Um, I want to thank the Prince Hall Masons for the incredible event that we had a few weeks back. The, the music, the celebration, um, it, just the formality was just breathtaking. Um, I think me, me and Mr. DeCourcy let Mr. Helmuth represent us as far as singing from the board so as to not be shown up by Mr. Helmuth, but it really was an incredible event. Um, in conjunction with the Mystic Valley Lodge of the Masons and the other Arlington lodges as well. Uh, I, as far as, you know, I, I'm a lifelong Arlington resident and I'm sad, I'm saddened to even say that I didn't even know that the Prince Hall Cemetery existed until recently when this, this 
issue came to the forefront in Arlington with recent efforts. But in learning about Prince Hall and the life he lived and the, the accomplishments that he accomplished with, with the barriers in front of him, it was really an incredible story. And it's been just really an honor to learn about Prince Hall. I was watching the History Channel just a few days ago, and they had a, a special on Prince Hall and just went through his life and how he created the Prince Hall Masonry and his, his legacy and how the legacy endured into the Civil War and recruitment for soldiers for the Union Army and how it endures even today. So it's really an incredible cause and I'm, I'm happy that this was brought forth and I'm, I'm looking forward to all the efforts that we have going forward in relation to Prince Hall. Thank you, Mr. I just want to add again, we didn't thank Ms. Maloftrek at the beginning. I also want to note that with us this evening, I didn't identify the, the Grand uh, Master of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, Timothy Downs, is, is with us. And thank, thank you for being here this evening. And there's another member from, from the lodge as well. And we appreciate you being, being here um, with us. And in addition to what we have learned, it, it would, uh, and we were referred to a number of things. Pref Professor Daniel Allen of, of Harvard has published an article about Prince Hall earlier this year in the Prince Hall Memorial in the Cambridge Common um, is, is, is something that, that we, were, we were made aware of. Now, it, it, it's been there for, for a while, but it's, it's a really remarkable um, career, and, and not enough people knew about the accomplishments of, of Prince Hall, and hopefully that's going to change. Um, so with that, um, I don't know if, if um, Grandmaster Downs, if you wanted to, to, to say anything this evening or um, we, we will be sending you a copy of the proclamation and we, we appreciate you joining us here tonight. Just um, say a few words. Uh, first of all, thank the, uh, the Town of Arlington uh, for um, for um, for this um, um, proclamation of making Prince Hall uh, the 20th, on the 24th of uh, June Prince Hall Day. And I met with the governor a couple of weeks ago and I mentioned to him that the town of Arlington uh, is making Prince Hall uh, the 24th of, uh, of uh, June Prince Hall Day. And right away he said, well, let's make it statewide. And he has done that. And so, while not taking any credibility, any any of the accolades from, from Town Ireland, I think this is because the Town Ireland acted to make Prince Hall uh, there on the 24th. So I appreciate uh, Beth and, and those who, um, who made it possible uh, for the Town of Ireland. Um, so I want to thank everyone for 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 uh, for the um, support, and um, we look forward to to uh, having greater things and greater education. Because as we know, Prince Hall uh, was the first person in Massachusetts as a as a black person to have a school, Prince Hall School. And so we're doing some great things right now at the Brown House, education wise. And we hope that we can get the support from, from, from the cities and towns around because we have to educate our young people. Uh, like the, uh, one of the previous speakers said, they didn't know anything about Prince Hall. And so, you know, uh, we all stand in on his shoulders. And we like to continue to stand on his shoulders because he did some great things. In, in, in his time, which was, I would believe, extremely difficult to accomplish, but he accomplished some great things. So I want to thank um, all the selectmen and women for the town of Arlington for the bold move this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and one last, I did want, also want to recognize Alan Jones and thank him for acting. Uh, he's a Mason here in Arlington and, and for his work as a, a, a liaison and, and uh, um, working with us as well. So um, on a motion, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And also, uh, I must recognize 
by sitting there around Warden and Justin Teddy. Okay, thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So on a, a motion by Mrs. Oh, one other thing? Oh, sure. Mr. Chair, I, I, I don't know uh, who's all representing the, the lodge, but there's also a gentleman named Jerome Frazier who's got their hand raised. I don't know if it's a representative of the lodge who wanted to also be. Yeah, it, is Mr. Frazier representative of the lodge or? He said that that's his uh, I'm not sure staff. Sure. And I okay. think he said go to the Reverend. Okay. Oh, Reverend, did you want to say something? Yeah. I think you might have to unmute him, uh, actually. The Reverend Joseph. Yeah, Reverend Petty, is that? Yeah. There it goes. Okay. There is it. Thanks, Hello. Reverend. Uh, good evening, everyone. Masonic. Protocol dictates that the Grand Master speaks for everyone. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I really appreciate you being here this evening. So on the proclamation, on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Helmuth for approval of the proclamation, uh, Attorney Heim for the roll call. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Uh, Mr. Diggins? Uh, Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Unanimous way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. We will now move on to our consent agenda. Uh, item five, minutes of meeting May 26th, 2021. Reappointments, all terms to expire June 30th, 2024. Commission for Arts and Culture. Kristen Bagnell, Thomas Fromacola, Beth Locke, Council on Aging, Nancy Cox, Mary Hung, Michael Quinn, Park and Recreation Commission, Jennifer Rothenberg, Scott Walker, Veterans Council, William Hayner, Anne Marie Russo, for approval, Arlington International Film Festival banners, April Rank, Executive Director, request for a contractor, drain layer license, Quiche Excavating, Inc., Quincy, Massachusetts. Uh, on the consent agenda, um, Mr. Helmut. Move approval. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? Second. Mr. Hurd? No comments. Mr. Diggins? No comments. Okay, on a motion by Mr. Helmut, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Hahn. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. Mr. Helmut? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCorsi? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great, thank you. Item nine is a public hearing. We're running a little late. It said it was for 7.15 p.m. Ortona Street, request to repair private way and a betterment order. Uh, and Sirdar Dugulu, resident, I think is a spokesperson, um, I believe is the residents are gonna be participating remotely. Okay, so if you could promote them, Ms. Mar, that'd be great. Good evening. Hello. I, uh, is this Miss? Oh, this is Mr. Douglas. If you could um, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the request for the repairs, um, and then we may have some questions for you on that before a vote. Sure. Uh, my name is Sardar Dugulu. Uh, I'm a resident on Ortona Street. So we've been living here since 2008. Uh, I, I guess as in any private way uh, about us here in Arlington, we're also suffering from these deteriorating conditions of our private way. This is a relatively short street, which is being utilized by uh, many at Arlington Heights. It's, it's almost like a shortcut actually coming from the Heights area into Appleton and then to Route 2. So it's about 275 feet long. It's relatively small, like I believe about 1,000 square yards is the total area. And I've been in touch with the, the town on and off for a while to get some basic repairs done. But eventually at some point in time, the town decided that you know, it wasn't worthwhile to patch the road anymore. And eventually starting from late 2019, we were able to get at least four of the six of others support. And eventually was, we were able to move the process up to this, uh, this two thirds approval and be able to get the repairs done, private uh, way repairs done. 
I myself is also not very happy with you know each of the abutters having to the need to pay four thousand five hundred dollars, you know twenty six thousand dollars to repair the road. But eventually everything is falling apart. I'm actually an abutter on Avola Street, which is right behind us. We're living on a corner actually, which will be liable again. So eventually, you know, now that we were able to bring the project into this stage, after a very slow process of two and a half to three years, uh, our request is right now to get these repairs done. Um, as, as again as quickly as possible, and eventually again it's it's going to be you know uh, all the abutters are ca are carrying the uh, the fiscal responsibility anyways. So uh, eventually, I think our request is basically to get the approval and move forward with this project. I mean, you know this is in the town's bylaws. Um, upon a petition of the abutters on a private way, if two thirds of the total number of abutting property owners petition the town, there is a mechanism for financing the repairs. But if you could just give us maybe a little bit of background on, on that, Attorney Heim, and then we can open it to questions from the board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just for the sort of public's knowledge and information, uh, this is a complicated issue in the sense that uh, it's, it's, it's hard for folks to understand that the town is basically prohibited from spending money to improve private property and private ways weren't laid out or developed because there was some advantage to private way owners they were laid out and developed for the purposes of basically building housing and so the only thing that the town is allowed to do under the general laws is to basically provide a low cost financing mechanism uh, that we call a betterment so the petition has to be approved by two-thirds of the total abutters. One-third of the cost has to be put down, and the abutters sign a contract. Uh, the town does provide some technical services to help in the betterment process. We sort of push the envelope as far as we can by providing the town engineer and some other folks to help navigate the process and make sure that uh, it's understood what needs to be done to repair a roadway. But essentially what happens is, given the board's approval on a petition for a betterment order, the town essentially uh, provides the other up to two-thirds of cost of repairing a roadway and puts it on as a low interest uh, assessment on uh, everybody's tax bills. Um, if there's a party who can't pay their portion of it um, up front, a larger portion of it can be put on uh, their, their tax bill to sort of uh, stretch out that cost over time. The town doesn't make money on betterment orders. The town probably uh, has a little bit of a net negative on this, probably lose a little money, but it's the only way, uh, absent accepting a private way, that we can help private way uh, abutters improve the roadways. And the thing about accepting a private way, just for a little bit more background, is that in order to accept a private way, Mr. Muse is here, um, uh, as a public way, you have to have it be, meet uh, public way standards, which are width, drainage, oftentimes storm drains, and that process would also be on the private way abutters to get it to uh, specifications before you could accept it as a public way. So I, I sympathize with a lot of folks. This has been an issue that's been a thorn in everybody's side for as long as anybody can remember. Um, it is it is a dis difficult and sometimes uh, uh, arduous process, but that's the basics of it. If the board has any questions or uh, the petitioners have any questions, I'm happy to talk about it further, but I hope that background is useful. Okay, no, very helpful. Thank, thank you, Attorney Heim. Um, I will turn it now to the board for questions, comments, motions, uh, and I'll start with Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just pausing a little bit to see if the echo that I was having is gone. It seems like it's gone. Good. Um, well, I am going to um, make a motion to uh, uh, approve of this um, of this um, repair um, work. Uh, and um, and I, I do have a question. If okay, uh, Mr. Chair, through um, through you to um, Mr. Heim. And so um, you explain a little bit about how um, private ways come into existence. You know, can you explain a little bit more? Like, so you have a public way that exists first. And then the private way branches off of that. I mean, how is there any any um, requirements or something uh, that the private way has to have in order to exist? 
Mr. Chairman? Yes, sure. So uh, th there's a lot of private ways in Arlington, uh, higher than, than many other communities. But basically what happened is you had large tracts of farmland mostly or other uh, basically large lots that were subdivided. And they were um, subdivided uh, and usually approved a long, long time ago by a board of survey, uh, whether it was a board of survey or it was a select board from you know, 80, 90, 100 years ago. Uh, some of them are more recent than that. But basically, um, in many instances, it wasn't feasible or it was very difficult to build a full-fledged public way. Um, and frankly, uh, oftentimes it was an expense that the folks who were developing these um, subdivisions didn't necessarily want to incur um, because of the cost and um, difficulty with building things out to being full-fledged public ways. So there isn't necessarily, unfortunately, a larger rhyme or reason to it. It's really more about the uh, development and sale of individual lots from a larger uh, subdivision. Again, I I'm, I'm not an Arlington historian, but I'm pretty certain that most of these areas, again, were either large residential lots that were subdivided into six, seven, eight houses, or they were even larger than that. They were farmlands and stuff like that that you know, essentially you had smaller, narrower uh, private ways developed on. There are some that existed prior to the way that the law is codified now. There's also something called a true private way. We don't need to get into that. Most of these are called statutory private ways. People have to be allowed to pass over them. Um, and unfortunately, the town is doing about as much as it can. Just so folks know, there are many towns that don't provide trash service or snow removal to private ways uh, because of the expense associated with that town meeting many, many moons ago voted to uh, provide those services. Thank you, Attorney Ham. Thank you, Mr. Um, thank you, Mr. Hurd. And, and given, I think this, this is a correct stat, I think about 40% of the roadway in Arlington is, 40, is, is private way. And, and so I have one more question, Mr. Chair, and that might be to um, Mr. Hurd. Uh, or any of you who deal in real estate, do you know to what extent people who buy um, property are aware of the fact that the street they're on is a private way? Mr. Hurd? I would say probably not unless, so there's a trade-off with private ways, right? Some listing agents might hold it out as on-street parking because that, the two issues that we hear most it seems like here is overnight parking and for a time we, we talked about private ways but uh, there's nothing that in the title that would jump out and say that you're on a private way but. okay well thank you i mean the only reason i bring this up is that we we can hear me the the um let's just say um less than positive emotion um, from the advocate about uh, the need to have to pay for this. I, mean, I don't know the extent to which uh, he was surprised by it, I mean, but to the extent people are, I mean, maybe we can do something so that they are aware that I mean, the road they're on is a private way and I mean, eventually they're going to have to pay something if they're going to want to keep up the stuff. But that's, but that's all for now. So thanks for um, indulging me on those questions. And, and once again, I do uh, make the motion to approve of this uh, repair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mrs. Mahan. I'd like to second that motion, and I don't have any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Um, just, I guess, a point of clarification from Attorney Haim, which I assume when you hit two-thirds on the, the nose, that's sufficient under the Private Way Act, because I don't think we've ever received a application at exactly two-thirds. Um, I just want to thank, uh, you know, for it seems probably a couple of years back now, we had a number of different private way groups of residents that came in and they were asking us to do things that we were legally barred from doing. And we often would direct them to the Private Way Act. And so I just want to thank the proponents for using the appropriate way to go about fixing the streets with, um, th through the Private Way Act. And I know it's not, it's difficult to go through the process and there's steps that you have to take and there's a financial burden, but you know, this is the remedy. The town does not have the ability to go and just repave a private way to, regardless of the condition, um, unless it's an extreme situation. 
And like I said, there's trade-offs. We hear a lot about overnight parking, and we hear a lot about pro private ways. So, you know, I, there's bad things about private ways, and there's good things about private ways. And I grew up on a private way right near Mr. DeCourcy in the Campbell Manor, and that was a more centralized association that could see road repairs coming. So I do feel for people that live on small private ways that have to take a sudden burden through the Betterment Act, but I do thank you for using the appropriate avenue to get these road repairs done. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I'm happy to support this. I just want to say to the proponent, I, I live on a private way. I feel your pain. Thank you for organizing it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Yeah, and as Mr. Hurd said, I'm on a private way, but I, I also want to reiterate what Attorney Heim said. This is a matter of, of, of state law. We don't control what, what can be spent in, in that the local bylaw allows us to, to provide some financial assistance for the repair, but in terms of the designation and what the town can do, our, our hands are tied there. So um, with a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. It's a public hearing, and I believe we have- Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. I believe we have two folks, their hand raised online. Yes. Okay, I'm very sorry, yeah. So if we can promote the two people with their hands raised, that's- Would you like me to do them one at a time? Sure. Okay, the first one's gonna be John Gersh. Okay. Ah, I'm, greetings, Gersh. select board. Uh, John Gersh, the Kipling Road. I would like to uh, make a comment on this because uh, I have been working with Sirdar on this, uh, this attempt uh, for a long time. And I just want to give you a quick impression of why I think Ortona Street is ex an exceptional case that is, uh, warrants uh, any additional consideration you can provide. Uh, and that's because it's a short road, less than 100 yards long. And it just so happens that everybody in precincts 16, 18, and 20 use this as a cut through as the Northwest Passage in between uh, Appleton Street and Route 2 and the Mass Ave, Trader Joe, Walgreen area. Uh, it's an extensive burden, I think, on the residents of this street to have hundreds of cars a day. Um, it's not your ordinary private way that's a sleepy little thing. This is uh, every delivery truck, every oil truck, every everything uh, is beating on this road. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a burden on the uh, butters. And that's, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, the next is Victoria Marsh. Okay. And then there's one more after if you consider. Okay. So, uh, Ms. Marsh, we can promote. You're muted. Hello. Hi. Thanks Good for evening. giving me a chance to speak. Um, as everyone stated, it's a very small street. Um, and so my question is, why does Arlington have it structured that we must pay one third up front. That's very onerous for each of us. Um, and it was mentioned before that there's, it's okay to go ahead and amortize the total cost. But if um, I, for instance, I wanted to amortize the total cost to relieve the burden of paying the one third up front, but then I learned from Serdar that that would raise the amount that he has to pay up front. Um, so I wondered why Arlington has it structured that we all must pay up front. Why can't it be amortized for all of us? That would be um, the kind of financial assistance that would be really meaningful in this case. I'm, I believe it's because the, the way the town bylaw is written in terms of how the costs are allocated and how town meeting determined that that's how this procedure should work. But if you can enlighten us further, Attorney Heim, on that. That's that's correct, Mr. Corsi. I, I'm not, I want to be very clear that the short answer is it's because Title Three, Article Three, Sections 6 and 7 say that's how we have to collect on the costs. 
Uh, and for better or for worse, I'm, again, I think all of us are sympathetic to the petitioners and the residents and uh, responsive to what Mr. Gersh had to say, but the board just doesn't have discretion under the bylaw to say that, you know, in certain circumstances that are heavily more traffic private ways, we can treat them differently. You'd have to amend the town bylaw. I'm not prepared tonight to say how much you can amend the town bylaw to make sure it's consistent with, I believe it's chapter 80, which is the general law that authorizes Betterment Acts. But, you know, it's, it's something that we could certainly look at in the future, but this is what the town bylaw requires. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Uh, is there another individual on the list? There is one more. Okay. Just takes a second. It's okay. I'm purposely not looking at you so you don't feel oh, no, it's okay. my eyeballs on you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Mr. McCarran, I, I uh, believe you're, you're muted right now. Sorry about that. But uh, thank you, everybody, and thanks to for doing all this work. I've been on Tona Street fixing potholes since I was in the eighth grade, uh, which was back in the early 60s. So I've hauled asphalt, filled holes, and I know what Artona Street means to everybody. But the gentleman made the point, there's 100 cars and trucks go up that a day. If it's a private way, it doesn't seem very private and never has been. How do you make it private? Sure. So, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, 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 there's a very long answer to the question, and there's a memo uh, that's quite extensive on the legal department's website on private ways. Anybody can read about it. But the really short answer is, there's nothing particularly fair about the way that the law developed. So there is something called a true private way. That's essentially a driveway. Uh, you know, this is more common in communities that are a little bit more rural, where you might have three or four houses at the very end of some very, very long driveway that's given a name, but isn't really what's called a, uh, isn't really a private way the way most are in Arlington. Arlington private ways are something the law calls a statutory private way. They were approved, uh, but not accepted. And the conditions of the law basically mean that people have to be allowed to pass over them. Um, and so again, I, I don't have answers on terms of the fact that it would seem to be nice if it was more equitable, but the only real options for private ways are for them either to be maintained in the process that we're talking about here, or unfortunately for residents to bear a different type of financial burden, which is usually to widen and install um, storm drains to meet public way specifications and then get those public ways accepted by town meeting. So there are possibilities, but most of those things are just as expensive, if not more expensive, unfortunately, than uh, the betterment process. I, I, I feel people's frustration, but it's, it's unfortunately not a function of some greater purpose. It's the way that your houses were part of a subdivision many, many years ago, and that's it. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Uh, is there anybody thank else you. on the list, Ms. Mark? Nope. Okay, all right, so thank you all for your, your comments. Thank you, Mr. Degulu, for bringing this forward to us. On a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, for approval of the request to repair and for the betterment order. Uh, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Thank Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, item 10, under licenses and permits, for approval, all alcohol license, the Heights Pub, 1314 Massachusetts Avenue, James O'Rourke. If we can promote Mr. O'Rourke or whoever else is with him this evening. Sure. Right. Good evening, Mr. O'Rourke and Mr. Betancourt. 
Good evening. Yeah. How are you? Good thing. Materials on the request, but if you could just tell us a little bit about the application um, before the board, um, and then we'll we'll go to questions or comments. Sure. Uh, thank you. I'll have uh, Mr. O'Rourke talk a little bit about uh, the Heights Pub um, that he's opening there, and um, with Bruce Canario, that's the app uh, putting the application in as manager. Uh, I think Jim is is on right now. So we're going to have about 70 seats, uh, full liquor license, hopefully. Um, just a place to gather for uh, the community. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like to first move approval um, subject to all conditions. Um, contained therein. Uh, I know there were some people that um, were questioning about the process um, and the common victor uh, license permit request being at the end, but that's the way it's structured uh, in terms of some people were saying, how can they build before they get in? Well, there's other town departments, and I think in your case, a neighboring city department that's been working with um, the owner and, and the contractors, subcontractors along the way. So this is the process as, as it's always been. I do know there's a lot of excitement up in the Heights. Um, I live a little bit further down parallel to uh, Jimmy's Steakhouse, but um, I've heard when I first got on the board, everyone would say East Arlington, unfortunately, is the third sister and really didn't have a lot of exciting things coming up and about and then that changed and then the center said hey look what you did in east arlington what about us up here um and that changed and uh we did have in the heights when uh the planning director was alan mclennan so i'm dating myself a couple of decades ago that you know did some improvements out there and i know the businesses have done the best that they can um and one of the things a lot of people in the Heights, and not in the Heights, uh, I know you have a, a good following from, I think, I believe it's Winchester, um, have said, you know, how come we don't have anything adult up here in the Heights besides D'Agostino's that closes at 9 where we get a really good sub? So there's a lot of talk about um, the Heights pub, a lot of excitement, anticipation, and people that really want to come down and know that when you're starting out a restaurant, um, and you all know this, and my family has several restaurants. It's a tough business to open, sometimes break even or make a profit and continue to do that over the years. So I wish you all the luck on that. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. I'll second the motion. I have no questions, but just as we, I said at your common Vic application a few weeks back, I live in the Heights as well. And there's a lot, I have a lot of neighbors who are very excited about the pub opening, and I look forward to getting in there once you open your doors, and uh, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. I wouldn't dare stand in the way between the folks in Arlington Heights and the pub, you know, but, but uh, I do just have a, a quick little question. You know, looking at the, um, the departments that have signed off on this, and so um, none of the departments have um, had no objections. I mean, four had no objections, but had comments. Then the building department's missing. I just don't see the building department accounted for in this. In, am I missing something? I don't know who that's to, Mr. Chair. Inspectional services. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It. It. Uh, that. That is being done through Medford Inspectional Services. So we don't see a, a, a report on that yet. Okay. Correct. Okay. All right. Thanks. Like I said, I'm not standing in the way of the pub. I'm happy to have them come aboard. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. And uh, I'll add my voice to, the, to my colleagues who are excited for this to get going. And I also live down on the Heights, and I have a lot of neighbors who are asking me about it. Uh, I do have a question for the applicant, and that is, can you tell us a little bit about your plans for alcohol server training? Mr. O'Rourke? The, all the servers will... All the servers will be TIP certified, which is um, they go through a course. Um, it's about a three hour video training. Um, so they will all be, it goes through 
being overserved and how to handle that. Um, you know, proper way to to serve a customer and how much they drink. So that will be addressed. Real important to us um, as a board and to someone to the board of health uh, for responsible al alcohol service. So I'm I'm delighted to hear that they're going to go through tips. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth, and and I support the the, the motion and uh, comments by my colleagues. I thought Mrs. Mahan was talking about the heights. A while back, they, we always had Charlie's Pizza up there, Mrs. Mahan's. Uh, that was about it. So, um, so, so pizza. yeah. <laughs> so, um, on a motion from Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, for approval of the all alcohol license, subject to all conditions. Attorney Heim, Mr. Hurd. I'm amazingly too young to remember that. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you very much, and best of luck. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you all. Item number 11, for approval, common victuallers license, prep neighborhood kitchen, Daniel Loperfido, or Loperfido, 1367, Massachusetts Ave. He's being Is he with us? Okay. Yes. Looks like he's with us, but it's not video. I think it's through his so his phone. Mm -hmm. Okay. I apologize. If it's the <laughs> video it doesn't appear to be working on the computer. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Hear. Tell us your name and a little bit about the application in the um, in the uh, prep neighborhood kitchen that uh, you'd like to open. Absolutely. Good evening. Thank you all for taking the time to uh, hear my application tonight. So my name is Daniel Perfido. I'm 32 years old. I've been managing and working in restaurants for pretty much my whole life. Um, was recently I was the general manager at the Fairmont Copley Plaza's Oaklawn Bar and Kitchen for about three years there. I managed at Chatham Bars Inn out in the Cape. I worked at Park Plaza opening up Doretta with Michael Schlau. Um, in the last few years, right before the pandemic, I had begun a search to open a small place of my own where I could pursue this as a personal craft and really take the time to connect with the community and engage in a local atmosphere beyond just luxury guests in a hotel setting. Um, so this place itself will have be primarily takeout. Um, there'll be about 16 seats inside, primarily American comfort food. We will serve naturally leavened pizzas. We'll do sandwiches, but they'll be on homemade bread and rolls. Um, seasonal salads, very farm to table oriented. So very um, rotational depending on what's in season at the moment. We do plan to serve a few desserts as well and some cold drinks, coffee drinks, non-alcoholic beverages. Um, from my time as a bar manager and mixologist, we're actually looking to do some really fun non-alcoholic stuff. So people walking through the town will be able to stop by for homemade shrubs mixed with sodas and items like that. It's essentially a, a fine dining approach to casual eating where you would have something you would expect at a premier place downtown, but at a really approachable um, price point for everyone in the neighborhood to gather. We say it's food that makes you feel good and it's food that feels a need. So perfect example of the food we're trying to provide. Um, my wife gave birth to our first son over the weekend and we're here at the house now. And my mother tried to send us food from a local restaurant. But in all reality, what we were given was nothing you'd want to feed your wife after she got home. And I'm looking to be able to have something that we could put meals out that people ate. They felt good about what they ate. They felt healthy. They felt sustained. They felt comforted. Um, and that's what we're really hoping to bring to the town. Well, congratulations on the birth of a, your baby over the weekend. Um, I'm going to turn it to the board now for questions or comments. Mr. Diggins. Uh, well, um, Mr. Chair, I would like to move approval of, of um, this um, license. Um, and um, my, um, I have um, two things to say. First, um, this being the, the month of June, I am going to have to come out as someone who likes the alcohol dehydrogenase gene, which means I can't process alcohol. I mean, so when I hear that you are a mixologist of non-alcoholic drinks, I mean, I'm like delighted at that. I'm looking forward to uh, try checking that out. And also um, the, the truffle the truffle popcorn, that has me intrigued. So I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to coming up to ACMI sometime because you're in that neighborhood and popping over to your place and checking out what you have. So welcome to, welcome to Arlington. Thanks. 
Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Yes, welcome to Arlington. And uh, my turn for personal connection of, of sorts. I saw on the menu that your pizza is not only naturally leavened, but done with fresh milled grains. Uh, one of my hobbies is artisan bread baking with grain that I mill at home on my countertop mill and, and use uh, sourdough culture. So I'm very interested in this pizza, and I look forward to trying it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you. Um, one question, and I guess uh, one comment. And I don't mill grain. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. I'm really impressed by I'll that. Give you some bread. Um, yes, I'll take the bread. Um, I just want to make sure that it was intentional um, that Mr. Loperfido, um, you want Tuesday through Sunday, um, so you won't be open on Monday. Was that your intention? I just want to double check. Yes, this is my intention. Um, we're actually looking to build a business model that over time will employ, you know, local, let's call them chefs and salary positions rather than uh, just hourly positions in a restaurant and sort of providing an opportunity for people who work in hospitality to provide a craft that they can grow with and live in a town with in a, a, like a sustainable way beyond the food for their own lifestyle as well. So some of that comes down to almost guaranteeing there's going to be a day off at some point in there where, you know, the people that work for us and myself will have time to be with the families. So now seven days a week, because on <laughs> happenstance, sometimes they, they say, no, I did want seven days. And then um, I do appreciate you have family meals in there, um, which is very exciting, so kind of to the point that you raised with, uh, and congratulations <coughs> on the new baby. Congratulations on your new family that's expanding. Um, and I just want to let you know here in Arlington, nothing is a, a prerequisite or requisite, um, but we do have a very active Chamber of Commerce, um, and especially now in, in COVID-19, they've been out there advocating for businesses who aren't members um, and getting the word out. Um, and, and one of the other things that, uh, is really effective are the Facebook groups we have here in Arlington. There's one for businesses called Vibrant Arlington, where they feature different businesses or businesses post to them that they'd like to have reposted that reaches a lot of people. Um, as well as I know a lot of people that um, go to Facebook or ask about restaurants and I see other people responding by tagging. Um, it doesn't have to be Facebook. Uh, that, that's where I see it used a lot. I don't know how um, it translates over to um, Twitter, Instagram. I know you can't do TikTok unless you're dancing in the kitchen, but um, I just wanted to let you, I know, you know, starting a new business, especially in the food services, um, you know, first of all, letting people know where you are and what you do is, is a big hurdle, but then also um, getting that word out so other people go down and experience it, like Mr. Helmuth, who's going to talk to you about your mill grains, um, and so that they can share it with other people when they say, I'm looking for something new or something that serves a family. So I wish you the best of luck, um, and I'm really excited to um, see that business come in. And uh, yes, Mr. Diggins, those, uh, the truffle popcorn caught my eye, too. You beat me to it, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. I can't believe I'm the first person to mention the fried pizza dough. Yeah. <laughs> that is just, well, that could be a daily occurrence for me. Um, but I do want to thank, first say congratulations. Hopefully you're getting some sleep in these past few days. Um, and this menu is just amazingly appetizing. I think the only difficulty is going to be deciding what to choose the first time I go in there. but. We'll have to make it, a, make it a few occasions to try everything. So I'm excited, and uh, welcome to the town, and thank you for choosing Arlington to start your business. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. And, and I, I want to echo the comments of my colleagues. I, this is a great-looking menu. It's, it's uh, really impressive and, and uh, really clever use of the, uh, the two Ps with the, the knife and the fork on, on prep. So um, I want to wish you the best of luck with your business and the best of luck um, with your family uh, as well with the, the, the great news that uh, you had this weekend. So on a, um, a motion for approval by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Heim. I'd be remiss if I didn't, in our first meeting back, uh, have a Kevin Greeley memorial Absolutely. request for samples. <laughs> yes. Did you bring samples? <laughs> <laughs> the virtual ones are difficult, but we'll have them first eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hurd. Yes. 
Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Best of luck. Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we have open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. Uh, Ms. Meyer, I, I don't believe there's anybody here in no, the we hall. Just checked. <laughs> and we'll check to see if there's anybody um, who wishes to present to us remotely. If they would just raise their hand if they would like to speak. I have one. Okay. Two. Two. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm gonna. It's Linda Veroni. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Veroni. If you could just say your name uh, for the record. You're on mute right now. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you very much. Um, this is my first um, select board uh, meeting, so I'm assuming that this would be the appropriate time to bring up the issue of the Chestnut Street crossing situation. So if you're speaking okay. about Chestnut Street, Street, we'll put you on the list for that. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I believe there's and one other name on the list. Yes, and it's Beth Malofchuk. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Malofchuk. Hi, thank Hi. you, uh, Beth Malofchuk, Russell Street. I just wanted to thank um, the select board and then also the supporters and colleagues who assisted um, with the Prince Hall uh, article. It was very much a group effort. I, I thank you for um, uh, acknowledging Alan Jones. It started with a conversation on up on Robbins Hill when I was walking my dog and I ran into he and Elizabeth. So I, um, I, I would just like to recognize the enormous support that uh, we received from the Mystic Valley Lodge, as well as I reached out to the NAACP, Zane Crute I had conversations with and he put me in touch with Barbara Boltz and Pearl Morrison. This was very much an Arlington effort and the Arlington Historical Society. Alan Jones was also a conduit to that wonderful organization. And I spoke with the, um, the president and then um, friends and fellow supporters in Arlington Fights Racism did an enormous amount of research uh, that helped me enormously as I tried to um, uh, formulate this um, article. So I just wanted to mention everybody. It was very much a town-wide effort. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that will conclude open forum for this evening. Uh, now on to traffic rules and orders and other business. Item 12 for approval, Festival of Love, Saturday, June 26, 2021 at Uncle Sam Plaza, 3 o'clock p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Laura Shakun or Shakun, Shira Leon, if, if they are here. So I don't see either of them, but if they are, if someone is representing them, if they could raise their hand. No one? No. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, I don't know. I know the application was submitted to the board. We have that in our packet here. Um, I'll turn to the board. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in, in light of the the the, um, the date, would it be appropriate to move approval of even in the absence of the proponents speaking? Yeah, I mean we've had that before. If, yeah, if, if the board is comfortable, we yeah. sure we can do that. Yeah, I looked. I looked it over. You know, it looks looks fine to me. It looks very like a small, simple event. So, um, you know, as long as as long as the uh, I mean, I know this has been vetted by the the uh, town manager as his designee, so I'm, I'm comfortable with that. So okay. I will move approval. Okay, thank you, um, Mrs. Mahan. Um, move approval for discussion, and um, if I may. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at their application, which um, I would have had questions if any representative was here um, for this group. Um, and in light of um, my commitment to really um, continue to pay attention um, in terms of Arlington, the community, and, and things that happen and go on there. So I think I heard my colleague, Mr. Helmuth, reference that someone from the, like, like one of the things where it talks about where you set up a table. <clears throat> and I, I see one table and few something speak, which is probably speaker. Um, does anyone have any more information about this event uh, before we do sort of a blanket approval where we don't? I mean, I know it says it's, it's, it's modeled after a similar event that happens um, up in Maine. Um, and I know they say they only anticipate 10 people, but... Um, if I could through you, sure. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, Mr. Chapterley and the town manager, do, did anyone from your office have any interface? And do you have any further info? If you don't, I totally understand. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, no, I, I have not spoken, nor has anybody in my office spoken with, with this group. The application came in through the board's office. Um, if I could attempt to, to read your mind, I think if the board does feel inclined to approve it, Either someone from my office or maybe from the police department can reach out and make sure that there's no blockage of the bikeway, that wherever a table and canopy is set up, that it's in a safe location and try to make sure it's, you know, its attendance is managed in such a way that it doesn't create any type of circulation issue in that area. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Yep. Um, again, given the timing, that I, I'm happy to support it. I think we should let people know that submit permit applications such as this going forward. And certainly I know the select board office informs people of this, but that they should be at the meeting just because, especially with, with a location like this, where you could do it right there and you could do it wrong there because there's a lot of traffic, that we just, if any future applicant is Part, especially listening to this meeting, they should know that they should be at the meeting. Um, and I think we've done before where we've approved subject to the authority of the town manager to work with the applicant. And so our approval is subject to the applicant complying with any guidance that they receive either from the town manager, planning department, or the police department regarding the way that the, this event is laid out. Mr. Chair. Yes. I'm happy to amend my motion to uh, to the conditions that Mr. Hurd suggested. Okay. And thank you, Ms. Mahan, for pointing out the, the uh, need that, for due diligence. That's great. No, I'll take that as a, a, an amendment to the motion. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. Yeah, you know, I don't know about this one. I mean, um, uh, it's, um, it's striking me as odd. You know, they're not here. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've approved them, and they're not here. But they're not here. Uh, and it's, it's running from 3 to 5.30. I mean, they're going to have a setup there. We don't know what hours it's going to run from, and so normally you need to have some buffer before and after. Uh, I don't know what this event like is. It, this event in Maine is like. It, I mean, it, I mean, I could guess it could go along with it, me, but me, I really would like to have. Me, I'd like to have some assurance, me, um, from town manager or someone, me, after this meeting, but before the event, me, that it's going to be okay, me, and then. And if it's not going to be okay, maybe we have to do something on an emergency basis you know, to to knock out our approval of it. But but I'm just not comfortable with this one. I'm sorry to say it, but I'm not. And so if someone wants to make me feel better about it, now's the time. Thanks. Um, Mr. Hurd? Well, I would just reiterate that we are essentially trusting the town manager and the police department. And to the applicant, if they are listening, 
we're approving it, but if the town manager and the police department don't approve the way that the event is described to them, then the event can't go on. So we don't need to have an emergency meeting to revoke the approval. The town manager and, and or chief, chief of police can tell them they can no longer hold the event. Yeah, any further comment, Mr. Diggins? Uh, we are mute. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Hurd. Okay. Yeah, I, I can go on with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. And, and I, I think we have to stress this is a conditional approval. If, if the event wasn't later this week, I don't think we would be even giving the conditional approval. And I think for people who come before us in the future for an event, it, they, they really should, should be here. So I think with those added conditions and controls, um, I could I could support the motion, but Ms. Meyer, I don't know if you have anything further to add. Um, there is one person that has their hand raised. I her name is Linda. I think she spoke before. I'm not sure if she's affiliated with this event. I don't know. Okay, I don't see. Um... I did speak with these applicants. Um, I did ask them to appear. I don't know where the disconnect went, <laughs> but um, they did let me know that it was a small event, that they were mimicking an event that was in Maine. Okay, yeah, I, I, I think we're gonna need more yeah. information through the I can reach manager. out to the applicant after the meeting. Okay, all right, and as far as Linda. She, um, well, she's up and down, I don't know if she's okay. confused. <laughs> yeah, okay, all yeah. right, so the, the hand we're is all set, down. Yep. Okay, so on a, on a motion, I'm gonna call it a motion for a conditional approval that was. Uh, I think Mr. Diggins has something. Oh, Mr. Diggins. Yeah, I, I guess I have one other thing. It's like, I just don't know how it's going to be limited to 10 in that spot. I mean, it's just going to draw attention. I mean, the, the 10, I'm just not buying. It's going to be 10. And so now what do we do um, if it's larger? But once again, I mean, I'm going to trust the town manager on this, I mean, and the police department. But this one just makes really uneasy. I don't know why, but, but it's just, I don't know. Um, I'll just stop there. Thank you. I, I think your concerns are well-founded because we, we don't have much before us. And in, and in this situation, I think um, because we don't have another meeting between now and the weekend, we will um, rely on the town manager's office and, and working with other departments, including the police, ahead of time. Um, but it's, it's an exception that I don't think, just speaking for myself, we might not be inclined to, to make in the future. People should be here the night that they um, send in an application. I agree. Okay. All right. So with that on a uh, motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Um, I'm, I'm going to vote no, uh, just because I'm just thinking of the precedent that we could be setting here, that someone says, I want to go down, have some signs, sing some songs with 10 people. Um, in the fact, I agree with the chair. If this happens again in the future and nobody's here, and it's a, like one of the most central locations in Arlington, so if anything goes left, um, it's a very well-traveled um, intersection. So um, I'm, I, I'm just not comfortable with having nothing before us. But I think what I'm hearing from my colleagues is that uh, the town manager starting Tuesday and has to get it done by Friday at noon along with the select board office. Uh, is gonna try to get more information, but um, with my colleagues' indulgence, I think if you, re you both reach out or s someone from your respective offices and there's st still no response, my personal preference would be please don't waste any more of your professional time um, because I'm, I'm anticipating we're not gonna you may not be successful, and I don't know if my colleagues are okay with that, but I think if the applicant is reached out by two different offices in town hall, um, you know, I don't want this to be, we tried them on Tuesday, we tried them on Wednesday, you know. Um, that would be my preference, but I'll leave it to the town manager how he decides to handle it with his staff and the chair and Ms. Marr uh, regarding the select board staff. Well, and I think if there's no further information, there's no event, the conditions Thank haven't right. been met, so right. let's... Right. Thank be clear you. on that um, between now and then. So um, 
we'll return. I, I believe I'm the last one left, Attorney High. Mr. Corsi. Yes. <laughs> it's okay. a 4 1 vote, correct? He, that's right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Item number 13 request for a handicap parking space on Allen Street. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This request came in through one of the businesses on Mass Ave, at the corner of Mass Ave and Allen, that has um, a number of elderly patients that they service. Um, I had been working with the Board Office, who's working with the Arlington Police Department. We're not at, we don't have the materials in front of us, so I'm going to ask for a motion to table this, but this will very likely be on with all the needed materials for our next meeting uh, with a location for the proposed handicap spot. Okay. So I'll, I'll take your motion if you want, rather than asking. So mo yep, motion mo to table. Motion okay. to table. If we have a second? Second. Okay. And rather than go through the board on, on a motion to table, that's been seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Great, thank you. Uh, next item, item 14 for approval, TAC recommendations for traffic coming on Chestnut Street, Howard Muse Transportation Advisory Committee. Thank you. Uh, welcome, welcome back. You've been here the whole evening. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, Mr. Muse. Uh, we'd like to do a slide presentation. Uh, this is a revised version of one we did at a public uh, listening session uh, updated to include the recommendations finally adopted by TAC. Sorry. I uh, wanted to talk about the background a little, <laughs> a little bit um, about why, what we're doing with this project and why. Uh, the most obvious reason is that there was a pedestrian fatality at the Chestnut Terrace Crosswalk uh, in December 31, 2019. Uh, and the board sent a request to TAC to study potential safety improvements along Chestnut Street, uh, all the way between Mystic Street and Medford Street. So we've been looking at it as uh, safety and traffic calming measures that could be implemented. And uh, just one action has already been taken in that TAC added crossing flags at the Chestnut Terrace crosswalk it was something we could do right away, and so we went ahead with that. Uh, Chestnut Street is 50 feet wide, and we mentioned that because that will affect how some of our recommendations fit into that, cross, uh, that width of roadway. It's also state numbered Route 60, so it carries a fair amount of traffic, 15,000 vehicles or more daily, and it also includes buses and trucks. And again, that's a factor we had to keep in mind with some of the things we're looking at. Currently, there are no bicycle accommodations. Parking is allowed on the north side and on the south side for weekends, I think, to serve uh, church traffic. Uh, what we call the slip lanes are the two right turn separate lanes, uh, right turn from Chestnut Street onto Mystic northbound and right turn from Mystic northbound to Chestnut Street. Uh, they're separated with islands from the main line of the roadway. Uh, they have very large radiuses on them, which allows traffic to move through fairly uh, quickly. And the crosswalk is approximately 215 feet from the Mystic, Mystic Check, Chestnut Street crosswalk. Uh, and it's really pretty much in the middle of Mystic Street because it's also about 235 feet from Medford Street. So one point of discussion is whether it could be moved and uh, it has driveways on either side of it uh, on the south side. So that's really not an option and very little would be gained by doing that. Just to go over the public engagement we had, it has been discussed extensively at TAC meetings uh, pretty much most every month uh, from about March 2020 to May of 2021. Uh, it, uh, we also had some good public participation 
uh, even at our regular TAC meetings, which is something that doesn't happen very often. Uh, we set up a Chestnut Street Community Survey, the Department of uh, Planning and Community Development organized and uh, administered that. What we did was ask people about possible short, medium, and long-term safety improvements. And uh, we, mailed out uh, we mailed to 190 properties around the area, and we provided s printed surveys in some of the residential places around the area. We received 162 responses. Um, I think the number in the memo was slightly lower than that. Um, the 60, 162 is the final number. And then we had the listening session on March 30th of this year, and there were about 30 participants there. Excuse me. So I want to go through a list of issues that were identified both in our TAC meetings, conversation within TAC, but also by the public listening session and uh, through the uh, survey. One of the major issues is the perception that there is speeding on Chestnut Street. Uh, so we're looking at things that might contribute to trying to reduce that. I mentioned the high speed turns through the slip lanes. Also the question of drivers not yielding to pedestrians at the crosswalk on the turns from Chestnut Street. Uh, if they're coming at a relatively high speed and um, uh, they don't have sight until they get out of the slip lane. That that's, can be problematic. So, uh, and in general, we have poor driver behavior in yielding to people in the crosswalk, which is a little more universal. Uh, there is inadequate pedestrian accommodations across Medford Street at Chestnut Street. And I'll talk about that in a little me more detail, but Basically, there's three separate crossings you have to make to get to the uh, south side. Vehicles queuing back from the Mr. Street at intersection uh, sometimes queue through the crosswalk. The town did install pavement markings and signs to not block the box. Uh, hopefully, if people obey that, then uh, people trying to cross won't be hidden between two uh, queued vehicles. Uh, we, we did some site visits and saw frequent bicycle traffic there, but there are no marked bike lanes on the roadway. And also the sidewalk across the Russell Common parking lot driveway is broken, uh, and that would be the path people might take to go up to uh, the library and the town hall and other places in the center. Mentioned the crosswalk is about 250 feet from Mystic Street. Um, we wanted to look at whether this is an uncommon occurrence because there was an issue of whether this crosswalk is too close to the crosswalk at Mystic Street. Uh, the Minuteman Bikeway crossing at Mill Street, uh, which had a rapid flashing beacon installed at it, uh, is about 111 feet from the Mill Summer street crosswalk. So that's quite a bit closer. Um, there's also a right turn lane that's controlled by the signal and not, uh, not separated from the rest of the intersection, but there's a right turn lane that people can come around and they're on top of the, the crossing for the bikeway. Uh, Chestnut Street is posted for 25 miles per hour and if people are obeying that, you can see on the chart, <laughs> uh, I think forget, I can't see it myself, but the 25 miles per hour was well within the 215 feet a distance, so. 155. Hmm? Thank you. I think I need to get these replaced. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some of the uh, sources we looked at, including the Municipal Resource Guide from MassDOT, indicated crosswalks should be spaced two to 300 feet apart in developed areas. And I think we consider this area to be a developed area. It's part of the, basically part of the town center. Um, and up to 500 feet is acceptable. 
And of course, again, I mentioned that this crosswalk is about midway between the two crosswalks. So we were, wanted to focus on countermeasures uh, to make the crosswalk safer. Uh, and of course, the most immediate thing was to put in the flags, which we've had success with. That program started around the public schools, but we do have them in some other locations. The public was very supportive of the crosswalk locations. One of the questions we asked is whether we should remove it. And about 20% of the people, survey respondents, uh, responded in the positive. And again, the multi-stage crossing at Mystic and Chestnut, the response we're getting from the public is they don't want to cross the street at that location. They're not comfortable with it. So we went through, oh, could you back up? I sort of skipped over. Oh, yes, there. There's, you can see, uh, probably you can see it better in printed materials or on your own screens, but the graph is showing uh, the response we got from people for various options, and this was for the short term, I believe. And uh, you can see at the very first item was they didn't want to do any of the above, and there was, you know, I think it was three or four percent. So obviously the public is looking for some action at this location. Uh, repairing the sidewalk got more than half of uh, approval, uh, and installing the, um, we described it under short term as putting in uh, bump outs as a temporary measure, and then they, depending upon how successful they were, they could be made permanent. Uh, and just about that, received about 50% too, and then installing additional uh, warning signs for the crosswalk. Thanks. So th these are our recommendations. We ended up not breaking them up into short, medium, and long term. Instead, we just wanted to present a package. Uh, some of them can be done quicker than others, and we try to note that. Uh, obviously, I uh, mentioned the crumbling sidewalk across the driveway. Uh, we think that should be repaired and detection, detectable panels put on either side of it so that it's uh, improved handicap accessibility across there. And also, number two is to provide advanced warning signs for both approaches for both crosswalks. They have warning signs right at the crosswalk, but we believe it would be helpful if there's some advanced warning signs. A lot of folks asked for a no turn on red sign on the right turn lane from Chestnut Street westbound to Mystic Street northbound. Um, I think people see the red light and a lot of them are looking over their left shoulder to see if they can go. and. Uh, been ignoring whether somebody is walking in front of them. So, uh, so we, that's an easy thing to do just to install a sign. And then we mentioned the curb extensions on both sides of Chestnut Street, both crosswalks, um, going from term, temporary to permanent. Uh, next year, I believe right now, is programmed to resurface Chestnut Street, and that might be if we could do the temporary ones this year, then we would know what we would want to do when we could do it while the street was being resurfaced. We also looked at the possibility of installing center islands that would provide a refuge for people. Um, good example from my neighborhood in East Arlington was the uh, crosswalk at Orvis, which was four lanes wide. It's been reduced to three lanes, it has a bump outs and it has a median island. We had had two fatalities at that crosswalk over the years and as far as I know, it's been working very well. The other is to install a pedestrian activated warning signal, uh, such as the one we have at Mill Street. Uh, what that does is people have to push a button or be detected. With Mill Street works with detection, uh, and then it goes on. So it's not something going all the time, and it's different from what was a 
set up at Swan Street in the center, which uh, did not seem to work very well for that location. Uh, each of those would cost about $25,000. So uh, this improvement uh, would be something that could be done when the street is repaved, and that's to provide 11-foot travel lanes in each direction, 7-foot parking lanes on each side of Chestnut Street, and with a four-hour parking uh, uh, permitted, uh, which is consistent with the rest of uh, the center. Uh, five foot bicycle lanes on each side and a two foot buffer between the bicycle and the parking lane. It's possible when we get down to looking at exactly how we want to do that, uh, it might be good, possible to flip the bicycle and the buffer lane, but I think that's a judgment that should be made at the time uh, we're actually laying the roadway out. So we have a couple of additional recommendations. Um, I'm going to do the second bullet first, and that's um, items one, two, and three. I think, as I mentioned, as we were going along, could be implemented quickly. Uh, four and five could be installed. Um, well, uh, the temporary installations for four and five could also be done fairly quickly with a permanent installation when the work is done on Chestnut Street. Longer term, we'd like TAC will continue to look at this, uh, particularly at Chestnut Street and Mystic Street. Long term, I think we'd like to look at a possible redesign of that intersection uh, to eliminate those slip lanes. Uh, we would, the design might not be completely straightforward because of the need to accommodate trucks turning at that location. But the idea would be to eliminate uh, not have three crossings that have to be made at separate times in the cycle, but hopefully to have one single crossing. Um, and we were also would like to look at Chestnut Street and Medford Street. Uh, if you're walking on the south side of Chestnut Street toward Medford Street, there's no crosswalk to cross. Uh, you have to go up, I think it's about 150 feet, to get to a crosswalk, and then you'd have to double back to go down uh, to the uh, Warren Street intersection. Uh, so that seems like something, that, and I think another issue with that is that Medford Street comes straight into Chestnut Street, almost like a merge from a highway. And uh, I think it would be better if we could have uh, clearer control uh, for who gets to move when. And of course our action is requesting the board to approve these recommendations. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Muse. Oh, could I just also mention, sure. I have Dan Amstutz is here uh, from the planning department, and Jeff Max Tudis, who is vice chair, is, I believe, on uh, line. And I asked them to be here to help answer questions and fill in any uh, things I missed. Thank you very much. Nice to see you, Mr. Amstutz. I don't know if you have anything to add now or um, any questions that you, you want to handle. We'll do whatever your preference is. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Daniel Amstutz, Senior Trans Transportation Planner for the town. Just wanted to say, so the full, um, within the materials included the full survey, so you could see all of the questions and all of the answers and comments on that. Um, you could see, you know, that people were uh, majority uh, in favor of many of these these improvements, um, so that was that was the point about sort of the the twenty percent. Only twenty percent of people said that they wanted to remove the crosswalk, which was something that was suggested earlier on. And so there's um, also the summary of the comments from the public uh, listening session that we had. So just again showing that there was a lot of public engagement. We tried to get through in in getting the um, public interest and and. Um, how people use that crosswalk and what their thoughts were on what would be some of the best, um, some of the countermeasures that we identified and sort of which ones would be, would, would be better. So um, there's a few other things in the materials too, just sort of give the board the complete picture of everything that, that TAC did sort of leading up to these recommendations. Great. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna turn to the board, but uh, ask Ms. Marr if there are people who wanna be heard on this. We'll have questions for Mr. Muse first, and then we'll hear from anybody uh, from the Would public. Would you like me to promote Jeff? Sure. Here. Okay. Yep. Great. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Max Tudis. Good evening, members of the board. Wondering if, if you want to add anything now, I know you're available for questions. If there's anything you want to add to the presentation, um, just a couple things. Um, the, the TAC took careful consideration of this over a while, um, knowing that it's a sensitive issue and it's an important issue. Um, but the area on Chestnut Street is really dominated by vehicular traffic today. And one of the, the goals of the TAC is really to look at improvements um, for all modes of transportation. And we're not seeing that um, pedestrians and bicycles are really getting um, you know, equal benefits um, of that, that area. So. Um, we think our improvements will, um, our recommendations will improve um, safety and mobility for both pedestrians and bicycles, while not significantly reducing uh, capacity uh, for, for uh, vehicular traffic. Might I add something? Sure. Uh, I just wanted to point out that when we sent our recommendations in, we also sent a letter from the town engineer where he expressed some reservations about uh, what we were talking about doing and I just want to make sure everybody was aware of that. Yeah, no, we, we see that. I imagine there may be some questions on, on the particular on Chestnut Terrace, I believe. Yes. Okay. Um, so I will turn to the, to the board now. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Well, since and I uh, voted for the well, have some questions perhaps later for the town manager. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Um, I move approval. Thank you. And um, just one question. Thank you for your work. I uh, was happy to read the, the very detailed um, report and, and materials that you sent. It was very, very helpful. Um, so thank you for your diligence. Thank you for your diligence in these months in studying this really important uh, area. And, uh, and, and I have to say, too, I, I was glad to hear that you had a lot of citizen participation. I heard a lot from, from citizens just as a select board member in advance of this meeting. Um, I think they all were really passionate about that crosswalk staying where it is. Um, and it was, great, it was great to hear from that. And I, I would say to the, to the public, um, write to us. You know, we read, we read, we read the notes and we, we consider them. Um, so that was, that was good to hear citizens participating in their government. Uh, my only question is, and, and, and I like the proposals to do some of the temporary um, changes to, to study them and, and to see if it does what we think it's going to do. Um, and I saw that there were costs estimated for the permanent. I, I'm not sure who, Mr. Chair, who the question for this is, but um, do we have a sense for the cost for the, for the temporary ones? Is it just negligible or is there a cost that we should consider? I think it would be small. I wouldn't call it negligible, but um, I, it would be a question of maybe putting out cones or uh, flexible posts uh, to make sure that people could see that area. Now, obviously, it wouldn't be raised up like a, a curb extension would be. But the idea is to let people get closer to the roadway when they're behind, uh, where there's cars parked, so that uh, they're more visible to people driving by. Uh, Mr. Amsos? Thank you. Um, I think uh, I would think about doing something similar. Bedford, um, Cambridge, Somerville. I think Boston has done a lot of similar sort of we call them tactical improvements. Um, one that comes to mind most recently from last year was that um, in Medford, along High Street, Route 60. I think at Boston Ave, there was um, that is also a very wide intersection and coming off of. I think Boston Ave to try to turn on to High Street can be rather difficult because there's just quite a lot of pavement space and it's sort of difficult to know when you're, when you're it's difficult to see. So 
the city um, put out, they, they sort of painted a line on the ground, on the, on the pavement, showing where a bump out would be. And then they put some, um, there's different names, you call them flex posts. They're, they're ones that um, I think either Cambridge and, and again, some of the, the larger cities have used to um, try to demarcate bicycle lanes, but they can also be used as or demarcating this temporary um, uh, you know, curb extension area or even potentially a refuge area, you know, not as well protected as, say, a physical curb or uh, a real bump out, but certainly more so than what's there now. Thank you. That's, that's good to know, and, and I appreciate that. I think it's good information for the public as well. Um, my only other question is, uh, you're also suggesting a temporary island as well, and, and uh, I know you wouldn't suggest that if you didn't think it was safe to do that, but you know, that's a whole, it seems like a different animal than, than showing where a curb extension would be. Can you detail how that can be done with a reasonable degree of safety? Um, I think one of the issues with trying to do that temporarily is that particularly at the Chestnut Street crosswalk, the center line of the road is not in the center of the road, yeah. which is where you would want uh, mm -hmm. the island. So it, it might have to wait until the road is reconfigured in the way we were suggesting or something similar to that. But uh, Jeff or Dan, if you'd like to add to that. Um, I'll just say that people were a little bit uh, more concerned about the refuge island. So, I mean, we, you know, we have examples in town already on Mass Ave and East Arlington. Um, I think it's a similar kind of idea that um, people may be going out into the crosswalk and then being kind of stuck in the middle of the road while they're waiting for traffic to mm -hmm. yield to them. And this would be sort of setting up that as, you know, if somebody needed to do that, that they would, they would be more visible, certainly, and the, the paint and the, paint and the uh, flex posts would, would mm -hmm. sort of channel the traffic mm -hmm. where you actually want it to go as opposed to um, being sort of a 20-foot wide lane where it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's very easy to, to, to uh, go from place to place and not be um, in the middle of the lane. So that, that's how I would imagine it would work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say, too, that I, I just as a, I, I have very happy to support this, and I really appreciate the intent of this, which is to, to really design this very traffic-centered place uh, to accommodate multimodal transportation. I think that's the world that we live in. That's what people are doing. So it's really important that our safety practices catch up you know, with, with what people are really doing and what their intent is. And uh, so, so thanks again for this. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And Mrs. Mahan. Um, I will definitely second this. Um, also with the understanding these are incremental s steps, some that can be done in the short term, some in the long. I would just give you sort of my rating um, of the seven recommendations. Um, I, I'd like to see one, two, three, four, and six as something um, that when we f continue further on in the process that that happened sort of on the front end. Um, I have a couple, hopefully only two comments on one question on, I have a lot of trepidation on five and I agree with Mr. Muse that um, perhaps we don't even do anything temporary and or permanent until we address number seven, which I see that not happening quickly. Because I'm thinking of the people um, that uh, we're concerned about and other people are concerned about, uh, not 100%, but residents of Chestnut Manor and um, on a traffic island, um, whether you're elderly, whether you're in your 30s or 20s, but you have a physical disability. Uh, and I'm thinking of the traffic islands on Mass Ave by Orvis. There's a lot more road there. And then there's also some people, in order for that to be effective and handicap accessible, because if you're asking someone who's pushing a stroller, has a walker or cane to step up onto that curb, um, nobody out there in their 20s or teens are watching this. Um, but some people do have issues uh, stepping up to a curb, especially in light of the state guidelines of how high that curb has to be. So what, um, so I'm just giving my preference for one, two, three, four, six, kind of go to the front of the pack, 
seven and then five at the end if uh, we do go through seven and it bears out. Um, my question is, um, the conglomeration of lights at Thousand, Thousand Islands, does anyone know what Thousand Islands? That's what we call it, yeah. Okay, the, the, uh, the lights there, are they um, traffic sensor controlled lights or are they just on this cycle that that's what they do at that same time every day of the week? I believe they're on a cycle that's programmable. Yeah. And I believe at one point they, they recently has been synced up. The town center project. Yeah. But I, I don't could know. You, if you could just step up to the, oh, to the I'm microphone. Oh, sorry. Sure. There, there's no visual um, that sensor. That intersection was part of the safe center study. Um, but I don't know what finally ended up. All of the equipment there is older. It was not replaced as this equipment was up on Mass Ave. So I'm not sure how much of an interface there is there. Okay. I asked that question because I knew the answer. Um, so I guess w the reason I'm segueing into that is um, if everyone's in agreement and we kind of hold five and seven um, and perhaps start with seven first, when we do do that, um, I don't know if there's anything that can be done in the sh short term, but um, especially in the morning commute, it's really just 7.30 to 9. That thing is just tied up mm -hmm. in front of the police station. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get to wave to Charlie Keefe in front of Keefe Funeral Home for like two cycles. So, and I don't know if that's something that we should even, um, if it's too time absorbent, even endeavor. And, and it's because those lights are cycle, on a cycle or not. So what I would say is I'd leave it to the town manager with planning or whomever, and I don't want to add any more to TAC, if that's something that we should look at or just kind of continue to let that play out because the traffic is going slower when there's that backup bottleneck. But um, I would just put a request in whether when we do get down the road to number seven, and it may not be exactly what we have before us, TAC may continue to look at it and say, well, we kind of want to take out two and replace them with two other that um, we also consider and, and TAC may be doing this, um, sort of upgrading the uh, traffic signals, traffic control signals down there to take them off of a strict cycle and, and, and cue it into traffic sens sensory. Um, unless that's cost prohibitive, because the other thing I know we're looking at is uh, Mr. Uh, DeCourcy, our chair, also chairs um, Long Range Planning Committee, and one of the things that um, the chair of that committee, as well as the chair of the finance committee, Charlie Foskett, have really um, put to the members of that group, which then branches out to everybody else, is um, we, we do have um, the funds, we've one-time funds from the federal government, um, ARP, I think it is. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, but that we really need to, before we embark on anything big in the future, whether the future is one or four years, um, you know, if there's things that we can't do that we'd like to do, um, if number seven becomes that, including my, my ask about the signals being changed, then I would say, you know, that's one of the things. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I didn't mean to go on so much. Thank you, Mrs. Mahon. Did you want to say something, may, Mr. May I, uh, sure. So I, I, I think that's a very good recommendation, Mrs. Mahan. In terms of when the light signalization could be analyzed, I want to talk more with Howard, Jeff, and Dan, and Mike Rademacher about whether or not it should be part of potentially number seven or the future step uh, looking at the slip lanes and the configuration of the intersection just to see what would make the most sense of when, not only looking at the timing, but new lights as well, right? If they're going to be changed, if, if we are going to change traffic patterns, I think putting new footings in the ground might be more appropriate for that, but I think we should look at that. And to your point about funding, um, I'm glad, I'm glad you raised that because I would ask the board to consider any vote it takes tonight being conditioned upon the identification of a funding source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not at all to slow down the process, but just acknowledging the reality of needing to identify funding. Um, so if, if the board, as it sure. continues to debate, would consider that, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Chair, do I need to amend my motion to that effect? Or is sure. That well, well, well yeah. why don't, if you're willing to do that, we will. Yes. Okay. So, so amended. Okay. Uh, Attorney Heim, before I turn to Mr. Hurd. I'm, I'm sorry, but this might be, Mr. Chair, this might be the appropriate time for me to mention something that the chair and I discussed briefly earlier. The town apparently received a federal aid to 
form a fairly comprehensive project all the way back in 1987 that listed a number of conditions, some of which are very specific about mm -hmm. where there are uh, prohibitions on turns on red, where uh, left lane must turn left, um, and Chestnut Street is one of many, many streets. Um, it's not 100% clear to me that the proposal is inconsistent with this, nor is it necessarily a problem. There may just be a process by which we have to notify Federal Highway Administration and the State Department of Transportation that we intend to make certain modifications. So if Mr. Helmuth would be willing to further amend that motion, uh, subject also to um, uh, uh, appropriate uh, reconciliation, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Manager, with uh, the Federal Aid Project of 1997, I I'd appreciate it. it reconciliation is <laughs> the perfect word there. If that's okay with you, Mr. Helmuth. In for a penny, in for a pound. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Can I, can I just ask, how, is, was that 1997 or 1987? I just want to make sure it's a clear record. Thank you. Sure. I apologize. Thank you, Mrs. Vaughn. Uh, okay, Mr. Hurd. I wasn't going to say this before, but it just, the funding discussion made me, reminded me that the MMA for years has been pushing to increase Chapter 90 funding by $100 million, and this is one of the reasons that we need to do that. Um, thank you for the work on this. We. In recognizing Howard earlier, we talked about all the time that you put in in the TAC, and this is certainly a good example of all the additional time. And unfortunately, we came here in some part due to a fatality that occurred here a few years back. And Ms. DeRosia's daughter may be listening, but we did receive a letter of support of the TAC recommendation from Anne DeRosia's daughter, who unfortunately lost her life at this um, in this area. Um, I am very happy to see the recommendations. Like Mrs. Mahan said, I'm, the only one that gives me a little pause is the intermediary safety lane. I don't know what the exact language that you use, but it didn't sound like that was part of any of the plan for any of the temporary improvements anyways. So I'm, I know if that is considered, it will be considered carefully and only in a ma manner that we know will be safe to do so. Um, and as far as the crosswalks, I, I do agree with the recommendation. This reminds me, when I was on TAC, when we had looked at Academy and Town Hall, mm. and we said, oh, they're too, too close. Why do you need those two crosswalks? And then we looked at the counts, and well, five times as many people use the crosswalk at Academy than Town Hall. So, you know, if you take out a crosswalk, it doesn't mean people aren't going to cross there. It just means people are going to cross there safer. So I, I do agree with the recommendation. And I'm happy to see the no turn on red because I often, you know, with the slip lanes, which I'll talk about in a minute, you go and you can't tell if you can keep going. I actually call it a straight on red because you're kind of just going through. And you're like this, and so it's good to at least, even that just one sign is going to have a dramatic effect on the safety of this area. So I, I am very happy with all of the suggestions, both temporary and long term. And I'm happy that TAC is going to consider to look at the slip lanes because even from an overhead view right now, it just doesn't, they don't make sense. And if this was a computer program that my son was on, I think you could just put your finger on those two and just slide them back and you'd have a safe intersection. So I look forward to further discussions about that. Um, but I support all the recommendations that you have in front of us and thank you for your work on this. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. And, and um, I agree with my colleagues, I, 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 particularly Mrs. Mahan's uh, comment on, on number five. That's the one that, that concerned me as well um, in the short term. And just a question on the, the right on, the no right on red or no turn on red um, from Chestnut to Mystic. I don't think right now there is a right turn arrow. I don't know if you went to a no turn on red, if you would have to upgrade the lights to allow maybe for a right a, a green signal when Mystic is taking a left on Chestnut because I think now it might be it might be red all the time there. I, I, I don't know if there's any way to configure that where you, it might allow for a little bit more turning, but you'd still have a no turn on red. Um, a longer cycle, if you will. Those two could overlap, and I honestly yeah, don't I remember, remember if they do. Um, and if they don't, that could possibly be a... Uh, Restriction sure. in the existing equipment that might not uh, let that happen. Well, 
as an early action, I think one of the things to do might be to ask DPW to look at what was proposed for that intersection and what was actually done at that intersection from signal standpoint. Okay. And if there's a difference, then the decision could be made whether to make an adjustment or not. And that would be relatively easy to do. Okay, all right. And, and I, on the crosswalk, I am in full agreement on the Chestnut Terrace. I was actually with a group that came down Mystic Street to, to head back towards the, the, the lot behind St. Agnes. No one even thought of crossing it. At Mystic, at the end of Chestnut, everybody headed right to the Chestnut Terrace uh, crosswalk, with the, and uh, I think that's a, a good location. So um, with that, if there are members of the public who want to be heard on this, I know this has been a significant issue, and we've received a lot of input. So uh, Ms. Maher, if there are people. We do have two hands raised. Okay. There's Linda, Ver three hands raised. <laughs> Linda Veroni, I'm going to promote her. Hi, Ms. Veroni, nice, nice to see you again. Hi, thank you for your patience. Um, I'm a resident of Chestnut Manor. So anytime I go into the center, I cross Chestnut Street at Chestnut Terrace. I'm lucky that I'm fit and have no mobility issues, but even I have difficulty crossing that intersection because there is heavy vehicles on the street. Plus, if the, if the uh, speed limit is 25 miles an hour, nothing, nothing travels at 25 miles an hour. It's between 35 and 45 miles an hour, which significantly increases the stopping distance for any tra traffic on Chestnut Street. Um, the crosswalk at Mystic and um, Chestnut Street is even more dangerous than the one at Chestnut Terrace. The sidewalks on both sides um, are narrow and there's absolutely no buffer between the traffic on the street and someone walking on the sidewalk. There's no parking lane, there's no green berm, there's nothing, it's sidewalk, heavy traffic that's moving fast. So that in its own way is is more um, dangerous than crossing at Chestnut Street. Um, there, it, there's talk about the red flags. Um, those have not been really adequate to the uh, speed of the traffic because this is not a quiet neighborhood street. It's a busy, heavily traveled street. Um, there's a talk about poor driver behavior already. Um, the lines in the do not block the um, the uh, the intersection are fading, and and cars are driving right in the middle of it. So that's that's not helpful. Plus, crossing the street even when there's no traffic there is still dangerous. Now I sent a letter to the board, and it included a photograph of the street. I took this in April. I hope you can see this. Okay, this is standing on the crosswalk in front of O'Keefe Funeral Home. And that car on the outgoing lane is, um, whoops, sorry about that. The car on the outgoing lane is approximately at the crosswalk. You cannot see the new signs that were placed there about a year ago. They're literally not visible. So that's why I'm saying we need to have a flashing pedestrian crossing sign like there is at Mill Street to let people know because of the curve, people will be able to see the flashing sign <clears throat> on the south side of the street, even if they can't see it on the north side of the street. So there's all this talk about adjusting the lanes and, and slowing down the traffic. That's a long-term project. What, the reason why this has become an issue is because a woman was killed in the crosswalk. So I'm thinking that moving to the most on-target solution for this, which is the flashing pedestrian crossing sign, is the best solution in, in the beginning, and then work on these other things 
as fine tuning of the larger um, Chestnut Street, Bedford Street, Mystic Street situation. List of recommendations, the warning for the, um, the crosswalk set. Thank you very much for your comments. Yeah. Um, next You're welcome. person. next person is Marcy Beck. Could you, I'm sorry, could you say that name? Yeah, sorry, it's Marcy Beck. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Marcy Beck. I'm the daughter of Andrew Rogers, the pedestrian who was struck and killed in the crosswalk um, on Chestnut Street. Um, I have lived in Arlington my entire life. I'm very familiar with the area. Um, and I visited my mother very frequently over the 20 years that she lived there at 47 Mystic Street. Um, she always would warn me when visiting her of the dangers crossing there. And I myself was very aware of how dangerous it is there to cross. Um, she would talk about the slip lanes and how dangerous they were and how cars would speed over the crosswalks. Um, she was extremely healthy. Um, she unfortunately that day had a minor knee injury um, and needed to use that crosswalk that was the closest crosswalk to her home. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that if there had been better pedestrian safety measures that she would still be alive today. Um, I've attended several of the TAC meetings and I'm in support of their recommendations. Um, and I wanna thank them for their hard work. Um, it's been a good source of healing for me and I appreciate everything that they've done. Um, and hopefully we can get the safety measures um, going as soon as possible um, to prevent this tragedy from ever happening again. So thank you very much. I'm very sorry for your loss. Okay. Uh, is there another speaker? Yep. The last one is Paul Schlippen. Okay. I'm going to promote him now. Good evening, Mr. Schlippen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, good, good evening. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to speak long because I have an extensive uh, report in your packet, and I know you've all read it. Uh, and I want to express my appreciation to TAC, which worked very hard on this issue and came up with some outstanding uh, recommendations. And there was a lot of debate going back and forth regarding this proposal. And, and I'm very impressed with the quality of work that has come out of it. Andrew Rocher was my downstairs neighbors. No doubt that if we had the flashing beacons, uh, she'd be alive today. And that's really why that's one of the priorities. But the slip lanes are inconsistent with an urban neighborhood. Uh, that intersection is located a block from the center of town. Uh, this is the only way for pedestrians to make way from north of the center into town, either by crossing uh, uh, Chestnut Street at one of three locations. Uh, the street needs to be rebuilt in a manner consistent with a street in an urban neighborhood. The slip lanes must go. I've talked to Representative Garbley, who's more than willing to help. Well, the project in Medford, uh, that his, uh, the Safe Routes to School project, uh, about five intersections uh, between the West Medford Station and the Rotary, has been funded by state funding uh, with state cooperation and he's willing to work with us to get that done if there is strong support from the town of Arlington and the strong support from this board for getting rid of those slip lanes and putting a traditional pedestrian safe intersection there. But uh, without any further discourse, these are good recommendations. I'm thankful it's before you. I'm thankful for the motion to adopt it. I urge you to adopt it tonight and to stand with the neighbors to make this a safe way to cross. My, my wife and I cross here very frequently. It's a very concerning place to cross and these safety measures will be an improvement in our lives in all of our neighbors. Thank you. 
Okay, I believe, unless there's any further comments from board members, we, um, I, uh, Mr. Diggins. Yes, yeah. so you all have touched on it uh, a bit and, uh, and asked in the town manager spoke a little bit about uh, how we're going to fund um, some of these recommendations. But I wanted to understand um, better um, that last um, modification uh, or amendment to the motion that Mr. Heim raised. I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Mr. Diggins? I, I did, um, uh, three years ago, I want to understand better uh, the the uh, amendment to the motion that Mr. Heim recommended regarding Mr. Heim's oh, uh, Mr. Well, Mr. Heim's recommendation on the 1987 agreement or on the source of funding? Mr. Yes. Chair? Yes, if I may. Um, Mr. Diggins, uh, essentially the last time, and, and maybe there was a time in between that I'm not aware of, that there was a major investment of federal funds to design and improve this particular area of roadway. It was, from all appearances, a fairly comprehensive project. There were certain conditions that the town agreed to as a condition of these funds, including things as specific as where parking would be prohibited, where left lanes had to turn left, where right lanes had to turn right, um, and the agreement essentially says that we're going to install and maintain these traffic control measures. Um, I don't frankly know, I'm just sort of getting apprised of this today, I don't frankly know what the uh, binding effect of a 1987 uh, grant agreement is, but it is a contract that we entered with uh, the Commonwealth uh, Department of Public Works on behalf of the um, Department of Transportation, uh, and it is uh, references the Federal Highway Administration and other folks who ultimately provided the funds. So what I have asked uh, for the board's motion is to just make sure that whatever recommendations are adopted by TAC are reconciled, thank you Mr. Manager, with our uh, obligations under this grant that we received quite some time ago. And it may be that some of these things might need to just be added as a sort of codicil, if you will, to this agreement that Federal Highway and the state are okay with the changes that we're making, or it may be that they turn around and say, you know what, it was 1987, you guys have fulfilled this agreement for, you know, 30 years, I think we're, we're good to go. Uh, but I just want to make sure that we don't lose any eligibility for future funding because we didn't follow a process for making sure that uh, uh, these changes are basically uh, okay with the state and with the Highway Administration. Okay, I understand. You know, so who will do who will do that follow up? I mean, who in town will do who will do the so called reconciliation process that we talked about? Yeah, I'll, I'll basically be reaching out to the uh, Mr. Diggins. I'll be reaching out to the Commonwealth and, if necessary, to the Highway Administration to make sure that anything that doesn't perfectly harm isn't perfectly in harmony with this prior grant agreement. Uh, can be recorded and approved uh, by them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank um, you. So I, I guess what I am a little concerned about Ian, is, is just I, I do want to make sure that the, if we approve this, me that we do have a, a real sequence for seeing it happen. Me, uh, and, and so the, the funding is going to be the issue. Me, and so the, we may have to have like some you know, logic trees you know, that fork a little bit, you know, but we think them through me you know, so that we, if ultimately we can't identify the funds in short order, then we have some mechanism for getting this in the queue uh, in next year's budget. You know, so so uh, maybe this is a discussion that, that maybe needs to happen in a subsequent, but soon, meeting, but, but let's just make sure that we, we really follow through on whatever we decide to do. Thank you. That's it. Mr. Diggins. There is one additional speaker. Okay. So we will, I think the person was on the list um, and we missed, is it Ms. Preston? It is. Okay. And that will be the last speaker for the public participation section of this, this uh, agenda item.
Good evening, Thank Ms. You. President. Um, this is a great moment. I've been working on this uh, for the pedestrian safety on Chestnut Street um, forever. As a matter of fact, I came before the select board over a year ago with my own proposal and you sent me to TAC. And I'm very glad you did because they've done a really excellent job. Um, there are a few pieces of this that make me a little nervous. Um, one is, since I thought about speaking, there seems to be all this red tape about old agreements. I really hope that can be worked through. Also, there was a sense that the temporary measures we put in place, and if successful, I thought the idea was to wait, you have to wait a year to resurface the street, then we could put in more permanent ones. And I hope if, if successful means that you will again have public participation. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it means um, because if um, hopefully people will be able to cross the street more easily, but the permanent changes are far more important. Like I don't feel like too comfortable standing behind a cone uh, <laughs> to protect myself from this heavy traffic. But um, maybe someone could respond to that. Is that a big condition or is it not? Uh, Mr. Mews, I don't know if you want to. I'm not sure I quite yeah. heard all uh, Well, I, I, I think part of the reason, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we hold the question? You have another question too? It, I, um, well, let, me, let me try to respond. Part of what was said earlier in the evening is that there, at some point there, the road is going to be redone. Yes. And so some of the temporary improvements, you don't want to make them permanent now because the roadway is going to be resurfaced. Um, and that the temporary work allows you to see if it's successful yes. and, and uh, without a major investment, only to have the investment uh, perhaps be in jeopardy when the road's resurfaced. Yep. Okay. Um, so that's, that's what we are. It has to do with future work. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. Th thank, thank you, Ms. Um, Preston. I, yeah, we're running a little short. If you have another, one other question, I'd be fine, but we're running towards the end of the hearing and with a number of agenda items this evening. But if you have another question, go right ahead. No, I just want to thank the Transportation Advisory Committee for the wonderful job they did on this. I feel quite relieved and happy. Okay, so that closes the public comment period. We have questions on the board and we have a motion by Mr. Helmuth seconded by Mrs. Mahan uh, for approval. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank Mr. you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. yes. Yeah, I misspoke. And, and thank you, thank you very much for the great work on this. <clears throat> okay, um, I would like the, to ask the board's indulgence to, if we can take item 18 out of order, which is a discussion on the Mugar property. Chief Flaherty has been with us most of the evening, and this is one item that she may be speaking on. So we'd like to take this out of order before we go back to 15, 16, 17. Um, Attorney Heim is going to present on this, but I, I had mentioned last meeting at New Business that I'd like to discuss various action items relating to the present condition of the site and work that needs to be done to clean the site. Um, I did mention that we would be reaching out to the Mugar interests to see if they would be willing to meet with us. We did not hear anything until today, and it was a wasn't an immediate response and at the timing of the response was such that we could not schedule meeting. So we wanna go forward and discuss options and perhaps take a vote on action items. So with that, Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just wanna note that um, I was able to conference last week with Christine Bongiorno, the health director, uh, Chief Flaherty, uh, Peter Buckley from my office, Emily Sullivan, the environmental planner, who also went on a site walk with um, representatives of not necessarily the property owners, but the applicants relative to the comprehensive permit and some of their folks, uh, I believe a representative from the BSC group, uh, 
so she also cultivated further information. So there's been a team effort to kind of develop a set of options given the relative uh, uh, lack of response by uh, the current property owner. So I just want to lay the table for an efficient discussion and also for public information. There's really two parallel things going on here. One is the comprehensive permit with respect to Thorndike Place, which is obviously not within the board's jurisdiction. We've talked a lot about that. But what I want folks to know is that's more of an in intermediate or long-term set of issues with respect to the site. Perhaps a comprehensive permit will be granted. Perhaps it won't. Perhaps it will be appealed. Perhaps it won't. But one of the things that uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals has been working on is a set of conditions that would talk about what would need to be done prior to transfer of that land either to a third party, the state, or even the town. That includes a lot of things that are longer term pictures like a 21E, a phase two environmental assessment, um, solid waste removal throughout all 17 acres, uh, a long term fund for the removal of heavily invasive species all throughout the entire site, uh, as well as other types of remediation and potential long term assistance for any uh, homeless that might be there, not tomorrow, not three months from now, but a couple years from now, if we ever get to a place where Thorndike Place uh, is actually a reality, and it may not be. But that's one track. The other track is what the board has been trying to do for quite some time with respect to acute conditions on the property a short-term or immediate-term set of things that this board and a lot of the departments have been working on trying to get more response from and cooperation with the MUGARs with respect to specific uh, health and safety issues um, and the um, uh, needs of some of the homeless folks who are out there. Because the uh, work of the police department and the uh, homeless uh, outreach coalition as well as our health department we have a challenge and an opportunity. My understanding is that most, if not all, of the folks who had been currently uh, encamped on that site have been transitioned to better housing situation. And so the site either is or shortly will be vacant. And if that is the case, there's an opportunity to do a lot of solid waste removal and really improve the site for the safety and uh, health of the neighborhood. And so we've been trying to get folks to respond. We've basically developed a series of options that we can sort of try to f take this to the next step because these meetings have largely, they've been largely unresponsive to meetings. My understanding is that the health director has forwarded them uh, some of the bills that the town has incurred uh, uh, entirely for uh, cleanup measures to date, efforts to try to uh, improve the site a little bit and address some specific health conditions. And, and I want to highlight basically three major remedies that the board has available. And I'll, I'll, I'll put an idea for a motion in front of you for your discussion and, and, and approval or modification. The first and probably strongest option is for the Health and Human Services Department and the Board of Health to determine whether or not there are violations of the state sanitary code. And if there are violations of the state sanitary code, they would essentially notice those violations to the property owner. The property owner has a very specific window to remediate those conditions. And if they don't, uh, not only are they uh, potentially facing fines, but the health department would be in a position to uh, perform what's called a clean and lean. So clean and lean is essentially when you hire uh, usually a private company to clean out either a portion of this site and do solid waste removal. There are some specific conditions of concern out there, um, such as the presence of certain paraphernalia and stuff like that. Um, and then you assess that cost as a lien on the property. And that accumulates interest until that essential uh, cost is, is paid off. And you cannot sell or otherwise transfer the property until that lien is taken care of. That's probably the strongest option, and it sort of has A, B, C, firm consequences and timelines. The second option, and these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, is the Conservation Commission. Emily Sullivan, our environmental planner, did go out and do a site walk. Um, they have found some potential violations of our local wetlands bylaw or uh, state environmental regulations. Uh, this is not necessarily as clear cut 
of a path. There's further investigation that would need to be done. I know we've talked a lot about things that have been dumped on the site over the years. That's probably one of the big concerns that they can look at, and the Conservation Commission would basically be performing a similar function to the Board of Health. It's unlikely that it would result in a quote-unquote clean and lean situation, but you still have a very specific enforcement mechanism with a financial uh, penalty for noncompliance. The final option that uh, we sort of see is a little bit more ambiguous. It's uh, action by my office to recoup costs that have already been incurred. I want to be realistic with uh, the select board. That's not a slam dunk, uh, but essentially uh, that option sort of terminal endpoint would be taking the property owners to small claims court to essentially recover costs the town has incurred in trying to uh, remediate the site to date. That's different than the clean and lean process. It would be more uh, backward looking. But again, these are all sticks essentially at this point in time to try to garner the type of cooperation and compliance that we're expecting. And it's disassociated from the 40B process. And it really should be and has to be both in, uh, from the board's perspective, but also from the property owner's perspective. It's not appropriate for the property owner to be expecting, oh, hey, we'll take care of these things only and when and if we get a comprehensive permit. That may be part of an intermediate or long-term condition to a comprehensive permit, but that's not what the select board is trying to address. They're trying to address the specific conditions that have worsened over time and become a more acute public health uh, hazard for the neighborhood that's there, as well as people who have been camping there. So um, again, there's a specific opportunity that comes along with this challenge. There are a few other things that I think the health department would like to see done, and have been in contact with the designee from the MUGARS. It's not that there's been no response, but that response really hasn't been, yes, this is what we're going to do, we'll do it by this period of time. And given the select board's previous overtures, I think it's clear that the board's patience has run out. We've already uh, given them some uh, deadlines that they've, they've passed. And so I, I don't see a softer approach than, than this. Even if it's not specifically within your jurisdiction, what I would recommend is a motion to, uh, one, encourage and support the Health and Human Services and Board Health to identify and prosecute any state sanitary code violations they find to the full extent of the law. Uh, including, as necessary, conducting cleanup and uh, setting liens on the property as appropriate. Two, uh, I'll just read it all out, but uh, encouraging and supporting the Conservation Commission to similarly identify and prosecute any violation of wetlands bylaws or state regulation, environmental regulations uh, to the full extent of the law. And then finally, to authorize the legal department to take all necessary actions to recoup funds expended by the town uh, to remediate dangerous conditions on the encampment site, including um, instituting court actions if necessary. And we have already started accumulating the manager's office, uh, the health uh, department has already started tallying what those costs reasonably could be. Probably some things that are easier than others, but I think it's fair to say that uh, there's been enough costs to the town and there hasn't been sufficient response for this board satisfaction uh, or the community satisfaction to date. I don't know if the manager or the chief or anybody wants to add anything, but um, again, I think this is building off of an acute crisis that uh, maybe changed the landscape a little bit, uh, enhanced the urgency, but a lot of these things the board has been talking about for a while, and there just hasn't been the responsiveness that anybody would expect. Great. Thank you, Attorney Hanna. Mr. Chapdelaine or Chief Flaherty, I don't know if either one of you want to add anything. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I first want to thank Town Council for putting together such a comprehensive recommendation for the board's consideration tonight. Uh, but I also want to underscore, uh, at least from town administration's point of view, uh, none of what's being recommended is about being anti-homeless person. What's being recommended, or, or take a step back, in fact, I think we'll continue to provide outreach and services to the homeless population of Arlington, as was highlighted by the good work of Officer Kniff and Hannah O'Halloran earlier tonight. What's being recommended tonight is based on the fact that the property owners have allowed for a public health nuisance to grow, have allowed for fire safety issues to grow on that property, and also, as was again highlighted under that earlier agenda item, allowed for potentially dangerous situations uh, to occur on that site. So I do think it's important, and I, and I 
pretty confident the board agrees with this that this is not an anti-homelessness position this is a position about keeping a site safe uh, for the entire community Jeff uh, Chief Flaherty Mr. Chair, thank you, Mr. Ham, for that background information. I support your recommendations. Um, I think that the homeless outreach team, and I appreciate your support tonight for the homeless outreach team, for Officer Kniff's work and for Hannah O'Hallon's work. Um, we've done an outstanding job of housing many of the um, homeless population that's been down living in the, on that property. Um, we've gotten grants and we've housed eight in permanent housing. And um, as of today, the site is vacant. So I would support uh, Mr. Ham's recommendation our goal is to make sure that the area is safe for not only our first responders, but for everybody in the community um, who plays in that area, works in that area, walks in that area, as well as the, um, the neighboring residents there. So I'd support the recommendations that Mr. Heim put before you. Great. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, I'll turn to the board now. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Uh, thank you, the Chief and Attorney Heim. I think this is long overdue. I think any <coughs> other re property owner in Arlington that even came close to the violations that we've seen in this property would have been would have been received sanctions a long time ago. Um, and we again, so I know the the site's vacant now, but we need to work. We need to get these property owners to the table and. It, to, with any mechanisms that, mechanisms that we have at our disposal because without any sort of security or further action to prevent further encampments, I mean, I'm quite certain that the word is out on this location and this property owner is doing, has done nothing to try to make this area safe. So it's going to be a never-ending cycle. It's, it's vacant today does not mean it's going to be vacant tomorrow or next week or the week after. So I will move as recommended by Attorney Heim and you know I support any efforts to bring make these property owners accountable for all of the transgressions that are at this property. Um, and Attorney Heim, so one question about the recommendation number two, and I think I know the answer, but hoping maybe I'll be surprised. So if the Conservation Commission were to issue an order of conditions, I know a lot of the gripe with people in the 40B process is that the 40B process for this particular site has allowed the developer to bypass some of our wetlands protection bylaws. If the Conservation Commission were to order, issue an order of conditions, would they have to comply with that order in order to transfer the property, like generally you'd have to if there was an order of conditions on a property? Yes, and I, so I want to separate. There's a difference between an order of uh, an order of conditions with respect to a comprehensive permit, mm -hmm. in order to basically remediate uh, conditions on a private property. So, generally speaking, if you want to transfer land that's got outstanding violations <coughs> on it, you're going to have issues uh, going through with that sale. I, I think the th there's a little bit of a so. So, generally speaking, yes. I, I think that there's consequences for failure to clean it up. I think the clean and lean is going to be a better and more surefire way. It's a little bit more proven sure. um, way of doing it. Um, if you don't clean up uh, or respond to penalty, penalties and fines imposed by um, other uh, town bylaws, you can have those also asserted and added onto as a lien. It's just likely going to be a smaller, more modest amount. So it's a possibility. I also just want to be clear that it's the standard there is going to be a little bit um, higher, and I got we have to make sure that we've got a solid basis to, to prosecute that. It's probably a little bit more difficult than the sanitary stuff, but I, I think it's worth your encouragement and support of the Conservation Commission uh, to do so um, if they uh, find violations out there. Thank you. Yeah, and again, like I said, this is long overdue, and. I support any efforts in using any means that we have available to try to get the property owners and hold them responsible. You know, the neighbors in that area have long taken the burden of this property owner's negligence. And a lot of the, you know, there's discussions about trash and there's discussions about the homeless population. And 
you know, there's just, it seems to me that most of the discussions with neighbors talk about the condition of the property and the trash buildup, and that's something that this can really address. And if we can get them to the table, we can try to find, find out long-term solutions to uh, really comprehensively deal with the problems at this, this location. So if this is the first step, then I absolutely support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mrs. Mahan. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. I will definitely second that. And just as a sort of springboard for the select board office when they do the minutes, if I could just really quickly take what I sort of encapsulated as the three-part motion, and then if um, Ms. Marr could go back to Attorney Heim if there's anything I left out of it, that um, we're going to vote and authorize the Health and Human Services and Board of Health Offices, offices to investigate and determine any possible violations, um, not limited to, but including state sanitation codes, to calculate and assess any fines as a result of that investigation, as well as to explore and possibly deploy the clean and lean process um, for any losses the town has and will incur on property to be placed as a lien. Second, conserva Concom Conservation Commission um, investigate any possible wetlands bylaw non-compliance, identify and prosecute, um, not limited to, but also including any financial pen penalty assessed there too. And then that um, also voting and authorize the town council and his office, office in, in concert with appropriate department heads to investigate any and all possible costs incurred by the town, which have been incurred by the town and may possibly in the future, um, and to calculate those recovering costs and or suggest any necessary legal action there too. Is that okay? Does that kind of? Yes, thank you very much, Mrs. Mahan. I, that's a great summary of it. I, the only, uh, the only uh, slight modification I make is that uh, I'm the one that needs the authorization. Okay. The uh, CONCOM and the Board of Health just need support and encouragement because technically speaking, they have the authorization now but I, I think it would be helpful for them to have the support and encouragement of this board to do so. Okay, so. One, and, one and two is move, yep. and three is authorized. And I, I, I apologize, Mr. Hurd, if you take that as a friendly second, only because I know what it's like when you're... Yep, sure. Okay, thank you. I was gonna to defer to Attorney Hines. <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Mohan. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, I'm happy to strongly support this. I just have one question. Uh, <clears throat> probably for the town manager through the chair. Uh, did I understand correctly that the clean and lean process is possible because the site is currently vacant? And if it were to not, be, if it were to become unvacant again, would, would that create a barrier to accomplishing that process? And if so, what would be the course of action? Go ahead. Yeah. We'll well, let me do it before you, I mean, I, I, I think part of this all along has been, we've been balancing the, the need to provide services to the homeless population at the site. And I think that's what has been delaying the type of action that Attorney Heim is talking about now. And, and if you want to add anything further to that. Uh, the only thing I'd add, Mr. Chairman, is that it's been conveyed to the property owners that this is the circumstance, that there's an opportunity here because when there are folks actively encamped out there, it's difficult to take some of the actions that probably should be taken mm -hmm. without being really disruptive to those folks. Mm -hmm. um, here we've had a, a, a pretty significant incident, um, but through the terrific work of homeless outreach mm -hmm. uh, team, uh, we've been able to safely relocate folks. Mm -hmm. And so now is the opportunity mm -hmm. to accomplish a lot of these things without um, having to engage in some of the balance that you folks have all been trying to do, which is a, a, a respect for the dignity of folks who are encamped out there, uh, but also, you know, concern for their safety and health mm -hmm. and concern for the neighborhood safety. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. Did you have anything to add? No. no. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and I appreciate that. I think that, um, you know, I, I appreciate the clear sense that this is in no way 
intended to be a, a move against the unhoused folks. You know, in fact, quite the opposite, that, that the safety and health concerns are, are clear and present. Um, and, and I have to agree with the town manager. You know, we have, I think we're out of carrots. I am more than ready for a stick. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Diggins. Um, thank you, Mr. Yeah, Mayor. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, yeah, I support this. I mean, and I, I also agree with Mr. Hurd I mean, that uh, we need to figure out some way to stop uh, the um, problem from rematerializing. And that isn't really a matter of keeping homeless people out. I mean, but if they are going to be there, I mean, how do we provide for their existence there? in a way that doesn't lead to the problems that we are seeing now, mainly the, the, the um, accumulation of trash that is at the point that is a biohazard. Uh, because I, I went back there I mean, to help out on uh, the cleanup I mean, uh, in late April. And I would say to anyone listening I mean, who hasn't been there, if you go through the soccer fields at Thorndike and there's a little pathway that leads back there, I mean, it very rapidly turns into probably the most dystopian scene you have experienced in real life. I mean, and it was truly scary uh, for me um, cleaning up because there are lots of needles back there. Uh, and, and I was the, I, mean, I guess I don't watch enough scary movies, I mean, but I was afraid that I would turn over something and find a body part. Uh, and, and so I, I, I said rather naively, I mean, because uh, there seems to be some cases where people were trying to at least put their trash in a, accumulate their trash in, in, a, in a reasonable way, but there was no way for them to do that. And, and we can't, at least as I understand it, we can't put any trash receptacles back there for them to put things in it. I mean, but I guess along with doing these three things, maybe we can explore some other ways, I mean, if we can't keep people out, uh, I, mean, I understand the safety issues with keeping people out. If they are gonna come back, I mean, then let's try and, and do something, provide something that's more humane for them because it's one thing to say, I me mean, we're not anti-homeless, I mean, but I know we're probably in a bind where we can't do anything, but, but maybe we have to push the limits of what we can do a bit so that we do provide I me mean, some real dignity for the people who are who are going to be there if they return. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. I just want to say one thing. The, the day that you were out there, and I was out there a couple of times, those were designated cleanup days. So just to be clear to people who are watching, no one is encouraged to go into the woods there. It, it, it's, 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 there, there were days that were designated that we were there, that the owner knew we were going in there to clean. But I, I just want to... Um, in case people want to see what it looks like. Don't go in there and see what it looks like. We want to get the site cleaned up. We still want to provide services who, for people who are in need or who are, who are homeless, but not, not at that site. We want to try to house people. We want to work with the Somerville Homeless Coalition. But um, those days, yeah, there was a lot to see there, but it was, it's not something that people should want to explore. Um, so I, I want to thank Attorney Heim. This is exactly the type of options that, that I wanted to, to hear tonight when I spoke at the last meeting about taking action because uh, they um, we didn't receive any cooperation through uh, uh, since all of the overtures that we've made to work together with the owner to try to find a solution and we got nothing and so this is what we're going to do now and we're going to push forward and if they want to talk we certainly are, are willing to talk but it's going to be with with these um, conditions or with these actions that we're going to take, uh, provided that we have a vote here. So um, I fully support the motion by Mr. Hurd that was seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Um, so on a motion that has been made and seconded um, to authorize Attorney Heim and to encourage the Board of Health and the Conservation Commission. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And th thank you very much, Chief Flaherty, for you, Chief. Uh, staying with us this evening. And I, I just want to say thank you, Mr. Chair, um, uh, taking on this cumbersome year, but really um, you've done your research along with the rest of us, but really um, the neighborhood meetings that you've had and, and sometimes with Ms. Rowe, and this isn't something that you've just rushed right into. I think you've given it more than enough time, and um, I'm 
uh, thankful that you encouraged us all to take some really decisive actions. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. You're here. Um, okay. Um, okay, for now, next up is item 15 um, for approval outdoor seating. Uh, Ali Carter. Yes, Ali is here. Oh, I was going to say, is she here? Here, she's been sitting no. out there. She's zoomed oh, here. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Sorry about that. We, <laughs> we uh, have an ambitious agenda tonight. I'm sorry you're toward the end of it. So, I um, appreciate you waiting and, and uh, to present the memo on outdoor city or a presentation. No worries. I'll do my best to be very brief. I'm Ali Carter, Economic Development Coordinator for the town. Just a brief summary of why I'm here and why I'm here now tonight making this request. It's a request for three public parklets um, in parts of town that have don't have any public parklet seating, Brattle Square, uh, Mass Ave and Highland Ave and East Arlington. And then one private parklet to a non-restaurant business that I felt like needed additional just consideration because it didn't fit into the dining category of the, you know, the uh, pandemic responsive program we created. Um, that's the long and short of it, but I'm happy. I, oh, and wh why now? Um, I wanted to make sure that all of the restaurants or as many as possible who wanted this equipment, the privately owned ones had it before we made public ones, but this would put the full complement of our equipment that we got from the Mascot Shared Streets grant last year out on the street. There may be one other resta restaurant that applies for um, uh, outdoor dining, but they have indicated that they have the resources to um, provide their own equipment. So happy to answer any questions. I'd like to move approval and I'd like to, I know um, Ms. Carter, Allie's keeping it brief and I can sort of shorten down and read from um, the information you submitted to us, but could you on these, uh, I think it's four proposals, um, four or five proposals, if you could just sort of just go through them one by one and just basically say where they are, what businesses they're adjacent to, Absolutely. that doesn't mean other businesses aren't. Just so people out there who don't have this memo before them. Mr. Chair, if I Absolutely. Um, so one would be at Brattle Square. Um, it's asking for six picnic tables to be situated on the sidewalk, so it would not have any parking impacts. Um, and this would be uh, to serve the um, about to open Dell's Lemonade location, as well as Andrina's Pizza on that block. Um, moving east down Mass Ave, Mass Ave um, Magic Bites and uh, Blue Ribbon Barbecue uh, near the corner of Mass Ave and Highland Ave have both asked for more outdoor seating. Um, since they're not providing direct table service, we decided to make it a public parklet since they're doing mostly uh, takeout. So um, just two tables there in that location that would repurpose two parking spaces. Um, then in East Arlington, Thrive Juice Cafe is just looking for um, sidewalk. So there would be two picnic tables outside that location and that will be a public parklet. That might've been a little vague in the memo. Um, I just needed to get the memo in by the posting deadline and I hadn't quite had confirmation from the restaurant owner yet, but public parklet there. So that would be the first in East Arlington. And then Clay Dreams um, wants to have a pottery painting parklet, which I think is a wonderful idea. Um, so again, because that didn't fit into the program as defined, I wanted to bring it before you all for your consideration. And that would take... Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, Mr. Diggins. I will happily second that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Um, always happy to support public dining, and we do love Clay Dreams, so happy to see that as well. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Helmuth. 
Thank you. I'm very happy to support this, and, and I, I want to thank uh, Ms. Carter for, for continuing to, to work on this. It's, it's a really great way that the town is supporting the businesses, particularly in light of the, the horrible year that many of them had economically, and I think that you know, this was a good way to provide them some business during the pandemic, but I'm really happy to see this expanded and the public's acceptance of it. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And yeah, I also support the other board members on, on this and, and thank you for the creativity and, and for the um, bringing these before us and uh, we're doing our best to, to help businesses in, in the, uh, the warmer months. So th 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 thank you so much. Um, so a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Uh, Attorney Hyde. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Carter. Thank you. Have a nice night. Okay. Thank you. I'm almost through the night. <laughs> <laughs> it continues. It continues. Uh, item 16, and I, I, I call this a preliminary discussion for overnight parking, and if the board will, will recall, we had a, a couple of parking warrant articles that had come before us specifically. They, they were in Precinct 4, but there were issues that related to the um, throughout the town and, and uh, some daily parking issues that would would have uh, applied to both precincts two, three, and four, and, and and other precincts in town. And the proponent of the Warren article, um, we moved no action on it. But at the time we moved no action, we agreed that at some point following town town meeting, we would have a discussion on various parking issues that whether it was day parking, whether it was pilot programs, whether it was uh, discussing the overnight parking ban and. My purpose tonight of to putting this on is not to make a decision as to what we do, but to, to talk about process. And I want to open it up to, to board members um, to have the dialogue, whether we do it through a, a separate hearing night on, on issues, whether members would prefer that we do it through a subcommittee process to come, come back to the board. So I'm just, we're not going to take any input on this tonight, but I want to just ask board members um, for their thoughts in, in terms of how we receive that information and, and maybe how we process it. So uh, I'll start with Mr. Hurd. Um, yeah, I'm happy to move forward with the discussions. I think overnight parking is probably one of the issues that we deal with most. Um, I think having, creating a committee to study is fine. I think overnight parking, as far as the ban in total, is something that is just going to have to be subject to a ballot question every so many years. So I think I'd also be supportive of starting the process of of just a ballot question just to take the, the town's temperature on it again, just to, because we hear a lot of you know people that tell us about the burdens of the overnight parking ban. I certainly understand that in certain areas of town, but it has always been unanimously supported, supported, or not unanimously, but has been supported by the town every time it's gone up for a ballot question. And it's, I think traditionally, the overnight park parking ban was people that had been in Arlington for a while that just liked that, that, that you couldn't park your streets overnight. Uh, park your cars overnight in the street. But, you know, there's, new, there's a lot of new aspects of the discussion, such as, you know, fighting climate change and reducing the amount of vehicles and promoting alternative vehicles that are other reason, rationales for the overnight parking ban. So I'm certainly, I, I think we will eventually, the more, if the more proponents push to overturn the overnight parking ban, go towards having another ballot question. but. I think if we have a committee that studies the issue and can kind of frame the question for voters, whereas, you know, does it still make sense that we don't allow overnight parking on Mass Ave? Does it, is there other locations that might be more suitable for it that aren't in front of people's houses? And globally, how we look at the way we issue waivers, um, I think a committee could, could certainly address those questions and we'll give them a charge and and they can take it from from there okay um, thank you mr Hurd. mr diggins um yeah i can see creating a committee uh but also we we have this connect arlington plan meeting and i think probably that's going to be on the agenda 
uh, for the select board, if not in July, then certainly uh, in August or, or early September, not to not to not to tell you what to do, Mr. Chair. You know, but I think we can. Um, we need to figure out how we're going to deal with that, in, uh, because in that uh, we can discuss or have um, we we can take on the parking issue, you know, and we can take it on. I mean, not simply for the time frame of a of a committee that might be more ad hoc, you know, uh, but for for the long term, and and, and um, so let's explore that. You know, I'm, I guess I'm a little hesitant about a ballot question you know, at this point. I mean, I understand where Mr. Hurt's coming from, uh, but but uh, I, I, I would prefer not to you know, do something that's going to perhaps you know, create a more potential for more divisiveness you know, and maybe you know, pit the East against I mean, the, the Heights. I mean, so I think we might need to come up with some ideas that are maybe more creative. I mean, so, once again, let's try to leverage I mean, the Connect Arlington plan, see how we can integrate discussions about a parking uh, into that as we determine how we're going to go forward with that plan. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with what uh, with Mr. Diggins' comments and Mr. Hurd's. Um, I'm not opposed to a ballot question. I think that it's been, what, about eight years since we did this last. But I really think that we'll get more information if that is more a more informed vote by the voters. You know, I think a simple thumbs up and thumbs down doesn't really tell us a lot given that there are some nuanced possibilities for what we could do instead. Um, and it, my, my experience of watching this debate for a number of years in Arlington is that it tend, it, it, if you kind of say, well, should we lift the parking ban or not, it turns it into a binary. And then people, I think people then define for themselves whether accurately or not what that could mean, you know, and, and I think if we uh, arrange for some work and some study to be done, that could, inc it could involve community forums. I mean, I, I'm not volunteering work for the planning department, but, um, but a process, a public input process where possibilities are drawn up and, and, and people give feedback might give us a sense for wh what could work or not work and um, and then give us something to go to the voters with if we do decide to, to do a, a non-binding um, thing. But, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, eight years is all that short. The town's changing a lot quickly, you know, and so I think it would be, it might not be unwise to take the temperature at some point. I, I would just rather do that if there was a subcommittee or some other designated process. Um, I'm not sure that at this point, just starting with a big open public hearing would be focused enough mm -hmm. um, with, enough, with all, enough alternatives, but this is just me kind of off the top of my head. So, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about it. I think we hear, we all hear about it a lot and um, we, I think the community deserves our uh, attention to this with maybe a creative twist to what could, could be possible. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um, <clears throat> agree with my colleagues. I think there should be a subcommittee. Um, but I just want to very briefly say it's sort of my understanding in the Warren article proponent uh, in speaking with you, Mr. Chair, that um, her several Warren articles really boiled down to globally East Arlington parking issues and then two subsets, overnight parking and commuter parking, daytime parking, is that right? That's right. Okay, so what I would like to do is um, have the subcommittee, um, perhaps as a, a, a springboard, um, um, define overnight parking, commuter parking. It would be for the town, but this really is an East Arlington issue. It's sort of like a socioeconomic issue. Um, in, we can do the ballot question, which is non-binding, but ultimately this board, we can still vote a different way. Um, so if, if we do the ballot question, we can look at it, and I think it's, it's gonna bear out what it has in the past, resoundingly in certain precincts in East Arlington, they want it, and then when you get to the center and the heights, they don't, and they kind of cross that out. So that might be sort of a guideline for the board, or the, that current board, after a ballot question, to look at it and say, well, we've had this subcommittee meeting. They've come up with, concerning um, overnight parking, a pilot program. Um, they say it should be, 
you know, one side of the street for four streets. We look at the results of the ballot question and see where, and I'm telling you precinct four is gonna be one of them, and you know that, um, where possibly to do that as a pilot program and also have them discuss if, um, should this be seasonal, like I think city of Waltham does, it's just in the good weather, not when you do snow plow, which if they do a recommendation like that, similar to what Mr. Hurd had said, sort of identify um, off-site places, not in front of residences. Um, I'm a little squeamish on Mass Ave, but I, you know, just because of the snow. And then also if they could come up with a strategy, maybe not so much a strategy on community, community, community parking, but how they get the outreach to their neighbors that there is a process, and if two thirds of you come in, you know, maybe a lot of them not aware of that process, um, that, you know, so it's more advocacy on how to address commuter parking, but um, one of the things I told Sylvia, and I think it might be bearing out for her, all your neighbors are gonna be, oh, I don't want those commuter parkers, but they don't want the signs going out in front of this house. So that's just a framework, and more will come out of it, but I think, I think at some point, um, the board, Really, Kevin Grilly's probably going crazy right now because he's, he's saying, I wanted to zoom into meetings, even though was, I've been trying to do 15 years, and he's gonna say, I've been trying to do an overnight parking trial, and nobody would listen to me. So, um, Kevin, you got a really strong voice, even from up in heaven, so Kevin from heaven. Um, th that would be my suggestions for the committee, and then you can just, uh, uh, determine who's the ex officio chair, or if, you or your designee should be the chair of this committee and come up with the framework. And my only thing is, let's not put people on unless it's something they really want as ex officios, because I see that happening a lot to, to department heads. Mm -hmm. Not from us, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, if they're gonna go there and do all that and not have a voice, then I think there's a better use of their time. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And, and I, so I'm going to take from the comments of the board. I, I would like to come back. It, and we can do this at our July meeting, maybe with a structure for committee. But I also want to um, hear from people. Mr. Helmuth said it earlier, and we have heard from a number of residents. And, and there are some, some issues, as, as Mrs. Mahan said. One, one of the things that you see uh, in East Arlington is there, there's no overnight parking, but people keep their cars in the driveway, and then they want to park in front of the house during the day but they can't because there's a commuter parker there, mm -hmm. there for the day. So, so those limits on, on parking maybe in certain areas during the day, pilot program type thing, and, and I agree on a town-wide type situation, it probably is something that, that, that should go to a ballot question, but I'm really open um, to talking about pilot programs just to see if they work and whether it's seasonal, whether it's certain precincts, and, um, but we will come back on a, on a committee structure on that. and. Uh, please continue to, to um, get in touch with us on those issues throughout town. So that's all I wanted to do this evening. I wanted to get some input. Uh, Mr. Hurt. Just briefly, just acknowledge that we do have a park advisory committee. So in coming up with the structure of this committee, we can see where there's overlap, where the two committees yes. can work, or if there's issues within the, that have been brought up that might be able to just dump on the park Correct. advisory committee that they can they're meeting right now, so they can deal with it immediately. Okay. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Well, yeah, with respect to that parking advisory committee, my, my understanding is that it's related to businesses, being not really residential, or am I wrong about that? From the business districts, but they've more recently studied the, um, I can't forget it, Whittemore Place or Whittemore Street, uh, the residential parking. So it's not out of the realm of possibility for the committee to use, to utilize that committee for consideration. Okay. All right, because I mean, that structure already exists. I mean, then, all right, and that's why I thought maybe we were talking about doing another committee, because if we already have a structure, then that could just become part of this charge. It's so, okay, thanks. If Good, I, I think there'll be other interested parties that don't serve on mm -hmm. the parking right, exactly. That's exactly right now sure. that we would need for this separate unit, but to the extent that some of them, some of the issues can just be dealt with by the Parking Advisory Committee, or we just fit in, we're not voting on anything tonight, it's just something to think about how the two committees can co can work, how can, they can reconcile each other. Great. All right, thanks. 
Okay, thank you. And, and so no oh. vote required on this. This was just a discussion. So I, I, I we're, getting, to me. we're getting towards the end. Did you want to say anything, Attorney Hammer? I'm sorry. I, I made a joke that I it, thought it, it, Attorney Heim would laugh at, but okay. he, he's I'm not. sorry. My, my <laughs> iPad just went out and showed me the, like, <laughs> Apple while we were just about to this. Okay. So I wasn't... Yeah. I think the iPad's giving us a hint. It wasn't a complete fail. The Huey Herman word of the day. Reconcile, I'm sorry. Okay. That's right. It's late. Okay. Item 17, again, a discussion on package store and marijuana licenses. I just want to set this up. I'll turn it over to Attorney Heim in a second. We have received inquiries, or Ms. Maher has received inquiries in the Select Board Office. Uh, we have one remaining package store license in town. There has been at least one inquiry. We've received a couple of inquiries on the remaining marijuana license, and I believe Attorney Heim also wants to talk about an additional marijuana license just to see if the board is inclined to um, open up that process. We don't have to select it tonight, but we might come back in July with a time frame for receiving applications if that's the board's desire. If not, then we... We'll at least know what the process is. So, Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I'm sorry, my iPad just, Ashley can yeah. testify <laughs> that, it, like, whatever it oh. just did was. Do you have, I, I have a hard back, copy of your memo. But if you it went black and then showed the apple and then it was. It was, yeah. it was distressing. No, I'm good. I'm good. I got, I got it yeah. back. Um, so, the three sort of pieces of this that are not, that, that, are, that are loosely connected are one, um, you have an available package store license. Uh, the board's practice, uh, Ms. Mahan has oftentimes reminded us of this, is that we wanted to sort of geographically distribute these licenses and we wanted to have a competitive process for open package store licenses because the board, unlike some other municipalities, hasn't really uh, been oriented towards transfer of these licenses. We've generally tried to make sure that we get the highest quality com competitor, even if, so, so usually you sort of put out a loose sort of request for proposals, if you will, saying this is the date by which we want folks who are interested in receiving a package store license to apply. The board will tentatively schedule a hearing for this date and decide based on you know the quality of the application, references, whatever else you folks remember from that process, this is who we think should get the package store license that's remaining. Um, there's only, uh, what is it, a total of eight of them? In Seven. Seven in Arlington. So it, it's obviously a license that sometimes you'll have more than one business is interested and only one can get it. That's the basics of, of, of the alcohol license. Um, and I've put your sort of general criteria from your handbook and alcohol <coughs> regulation policy in the memo for you. The second issue is uh, retail host community agreements. You currently have uh, two licensees who are uh, either open or are in the process of going through the special permit with the ARB. Um, you don't have an obligation to specifically use all three licenses by a certain point in time, but you do have some obligation to revisit the issue and solicit um, proposals for anybody who might be interested in the final host community agreement for a retail brick and mortar store. And then finally, something that's a relatively recent development is uh, the Cannabis Control Commission has now authorized delivery. Um, just to be clear for everybody uh, on the board and at home, we can't prevent people from delivering in Arlington. And right now, folks are allowed to deliver a product uh, in Arlington without having a brick and mortar store and they're allowed to have a marijuana delivery operation sited in Medford or Boston and they can come out to, to, to Arlington and deliver marijuana goods. They just can't sell them out of a store. We've actually had a fair number of inquiries about delivery host community agreements in Arlington, which means that somebody would site a business that does not have a retail storefront. You can't sell it out of the business, uh, but you still can A, have a host community agreement and B, collect 3% of uh, gross sale revenue through the local option that the town's already developed. So I just wanted to put this out there for the board. These licenses are limited right now to economic uh, empowerment candidates. So 
Um, only economic empowerment candidates can receive a delivery license at this point in time, which is a way of trying to kind of correct for the fact that these retail operations have been very, very hard for a lot of people to open. It tends to only be really well-financed operations that are able to uh, take it, make a go at that. Um, the only piece that, in addition to the timeline, that I could really use some clarity from the board on or would like to invite further discussion on is that the last time we had uh, host community agreement discussions and you considered two competing applications, there was no economic empowerment candidates who applied, uh, but there was this question about how to treat a priority applicant based on the idea that they were an Arlington resident who was proposing to open the business. And the basic summary was, if all things were equal, you'd give it to the priority applicant. There are other ways that you could structure that. You could invite only solicitations from priority applicants for a certain period of time, and if you don't give any to them, open it up to general applicants. You could have a more specific scoring that would basically you know, dictate that this is how much of a bonus we're gonna give to somebody who's either an economic empowerment candidate, and again, we've never had an economic empowerment candidate for the brick and mortar storefronts, um, or similarly for someone who's a local uh, Arlington resident. So I just wanted to highlight that. I'm not expecting the board to necessarily have an answer right now, but I think the two things that would be helpful is the timeline that you'd like to direct uh, my office and the planning department and maybe the ma manager's office, I know has been involved in these as well for, and obviously your office, for soliciting um, package store, retail, and delivery uh, sort of competition, if you will, and what, if any, tweaks you want to make to the process. I feel like you guys have had a pretty clear process on the package stores that doesn't necessarily need a formal application, but if that's what you guys want to do, I'm amenable to that. And I feel like the host community process that we've developed for our marijuana retailers has been pretty good. It's, 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 it's weathered the test of time in terms of Cannabis Control Commission advisories and regulations. The only thing that's been a little bit murky is how much of our priority do we want to make quote unquote priority applicants? Thank you. I know it's late. Thank I appreciate you, everything. Uh, I'll turn to the board. Mrs. Mahan. Um, everyone who knows me knows how I'm going to start with this. Um, just putting out my thoughts. I like to pick an end date to work backwards. So I'm just thinking out loud, and a lot of this also is contingent upon the chair because you have to oversee this and, and manage it. But if we, what I would say to Attorney Heim, the town manager, if we have in our end date um, meetings for one, some, all, or none of these occurring in the October to first week of November time frame, um, and then, and I'll leave this to the chair, and then work backwards from there, knowing that once the summer comes, and especially this summer, um, people are really going on vacations and things like that, and that's why I'm, I'm tending towards that. Um, now, we don't have to, we, we do have to put, demonstrate, and sometimes we don't. On the alcohol one, I mean, like, have we received any serious inquiry? Is it just inquiries on um, the host community agreement with delivery, or is it people calling up saying, what's the process, I want to apply for one of those? Uh, yes, Ms. Mahon, we, so we've, we've had a couple of folks, it's a decent number of folks on delivery saying, I'm pre-certified as an economic <clears throat> empowering candidate, uh, what's Arlington's process? When are you uh, going to open up? I want to apply. And what we've okay. been saying is, hold on. By the way, I left this important detail out. We just passed a zoning bylaw re uh, revision to allow for delivery. It's only in B4 and industrial by special permit. Those technically haven't been approved by the Attorney General's office yet. You can start your process because, again, you're just the host community part of it. The special permit process is all on the ARB. But I just wanted to note that that we haven't had, we haven't allowed for it yet in, in certain zones. So we, it's been a we have had a lot of inquiries, and I know we've had some about the package have, package yes. store. Yeah. Okay. So I would. Um, my thing is not to bite off too much um, because, you know, hopefully we're not stuck in that room again at 110 degrees. It sounds to me that if whatever the chair determines, an October to November time frame, um, I'm not really in a rush to put out the last remaining um, host community agreement for a brick and mortar. 
um, just because we haven't really received anything um, new and or old, but it's been updated. So I guess um, I would look to the chair in the, in the manager's office and attorney Heim to um, use an end date, work backwards for um, HCA delivery as well as um, all alcohol package store. We really don't have to recreate the real wheel on the alcohol package store because it's there, maybe some tweaks, but um, definitely um, I guess when town council thinks whatever before the summer hits that you can kind of along with, is it Attorney McLaughlin that works with you? What's his name? The Cunningham. 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 What are you? you know, perhaps this is something he, he could also, and I, I mean no slights. I'm, yeah. I'm exhausted. He no, looks no, like I'm an Attorney for, McLaughlin that I work for. I'm, I'm fooling around. He's, okay. I'm just, I'm making fun of him. Yeah, my case. maybe that's also something that can kind of kick up the work because um, if anything can be done, but maybe have something to, uh, to the chair um, by the first week, first 10 days of September. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Mott. Mr. Helmuth. I, I think given the hour, I give this a little more consideration if we had a fresh start at it. Um, I think that makes sense to me, though. I know nothing further at this hour. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and just what you want to think no, no, good. on timelines, I mean, if, if there is interest in the board, I, I, I heard from Mrs. Mahan on the all alcohol and on the delivery, but if you could just maybe share if, um, in, in, we can wait till till another meeting, but I'll, I'll turn to Mr. Hurd just on, you know, the willingness to go forward on yeah. uh, with the process on that. Uh, on the alcohol license, I actually didn't even realize that we had an additional alcohol license. I thought we only had that one. And I mean, if there are inquiries, I'm happy to see them. I don't. I think we have all the package stores we need. To be frank, I think we're pretty covered in the geographic locations that we came up with but if we have the license and we want to let people convince us that they like before we, we did this last time with the hca is where we took applications and we didn't pick anybody hmm. so there's no reason to hold it um then uh, on the h so just to clarify if we accept an hca for a delivery and it goes to the arb does that take up the last remaining special permit that they have? So it's not, right? So that's just brick and mortar? That's right. Okay. So, um, yeah, and um, again, that for me is just time because I know that there are, I've, when I was chair and even now I've got a lot of inquiries, even if they are from the same applicants, we do get a lot of inquiries. Yeah. And I know every time this comes up, it, there's a lot of work on Attorney Himes' office, there's a lot of work on the select board's office. So I think we should dispose of that by putting it out there and awarding it and letting that process play out. So I'm in agreement with the time frame that Mrs. Mahan, I think we can give some, some lead time to some people that, because again, in the, one of the main things that has been a barrier to applicants has been finding locations so if we can give them four or five months to find a suitable location so they're more prepared when they come before us mm -hmm. then and then once we get rid of them we don't have to take the inquiries anymore <laughs> so Good. Uh, thank you mr mr diggins uh, yes I, mean, uh, I guess my only concern about um at this point changing in the the waiting for um arlington based um um, prospects me for the HCA is given the way the last one happened it could just make it look like a, the board um, is just not treating um, the all the applicants in the same way and I guess maybe the whole point I mean of changing the the, the waiting to favor an Arlington um, based business uh, would well, that be the point of it I mean but but we not we didn't do it from the outset we'd be kind of changing it in in the in the middle of things. And I think if the last meeting on this had gone differently, well, I guess we wouldn't be talking about this now, but but there was just a, a I'm concerned about changing, um, changing the rules at this point. So, but this is just a preliminary discussion. I'm not locked in at all, I mean, and so, so um, that's it, thanks. Um, so I think we have some direction, maybe the next meeting we can come back with a timetable. The one thing I would say, Mr. Hurd is right. We uh, now as the, the current chair, I'm receiving a number of inquiries from the 
the two applicants and, and my feeling, I believe it was Mr. Hurd's as well, as we went through a process, we did have a subsequent meeting, but we're not at a stage where this is just a, a reconsideration type situation. This is a whole new application process. That would be my inclination with yeah, um, different board members and, and uh, just with the mere passage of time. So that, that's all I wanted from this discussion. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you very much for that. And um, no, number 19, uh, correspondence received, nuisance dog hearing. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Oh, you're on mute. I, re I move receipt of the letter. Uh, Mr. Helmuth? Second. Mrs. Mahan, any questions? No, thank you. Mr. Hurd? Okay, I'm on a motion to receive uh, by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. M Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's so dumb. Okay. Yeah, spoke. New business. Um, Ms. Meyer? No new business. Attorney Heim? I'm going to be super quick. I just want to remind folks that the uh, state did pass legislation extending uh, the ability to conduct remote uh, hearings and as well as doing some other things until April of next year. That basically means that we now have the option to have a hybrid meeting like we're having now. Folks on other committees and commissions, there's a memo that should have been circulated. If you haven't received it yet, contact your department head or professional liaison that just talks a little bit about these options. And I really appreciate uh, Representative Garbley uh, taking phone calls from me in somewhat of a panic about whether the ZBA hearing was going to be allowed to be conducted remotely that night. Uh, I, I know he was returning phone calls from me at like 7 o'clock in the evening, so I appreciate it very much. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chapdelin. Uh, I don't have any new business right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Helm? Uh, just a thank you to, uh, speaking of the hybrid meetings, this went off seamlessly, and that is not an accident. And, and I, I found out that, that the hardworking uh, technical crew at ACMI and the town IT department put in a lot of hours, many of them late at night over the last week, uh, to really hammer this out. And I just want to express my gratitude to that hard work and, uh, and my delight that this went well uh, with this hybrid meeting technology as it did tonight. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? Um, Two quick ones. Uh, first, I, I, I see that the um, ARP um, sort of uh, funding information of um, what cities and towns, how they can use those funds, and it, it's been more clarified, more defined. So I, through the chair, I would ask um, if either at our July meeting or and or the next um, long range planning uh, meeting that um, you in conjunction with the town manager uh, or anybody else sort of come up with where it seems like um, the ARP monies have been further defined so we can get a handle on it. Um, I don't know if it's first a long range planning in September and then back to the board, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And I also wanted to say, Mrs. Kropelka, go to bed. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, Mrs. Mike. Mr. Diggins. Uh, so I'd just like to um, thank uh, Julian Harvey and, and, the plan and whoever else was involved in planning Juneteenth, uh, the Juneteenth observation. They did a wonderful job. It was great seeing uh, colleagues out there and the nice turnout uh, uh, of the crowd. And, uh, I, I will say the, one of the speakers took us to task mean, and said that we should be support reparations. I have another way of going about that and, uh, that I'd like to um, talk about at some point in time. And also, I'd like to um, say that um, um, I am very seriously thinking about uh, doing a, a, a little forum uh, just with myself being, and, and the public to help people understand I mean, the, the warrant process being, and, and why uh, it's better to come to the board or come to the staff with issues rather than putting them in the, in, submitting them as an article in the warrant. I'll probably do that in July. Thank you. It's Mr. Hurd. Thank you. I also wanted to thank Jill Harvey and the Human Rights Commission and our, our very well represented general court um, for the great Juneteenth celebration. And Reverend Michael Schachter had a very empowering and moving speech that, you know, I, I think left us all with some food for thought to, to build on from the event. So I was happy to, to participate in that first that uh, first Juneteenth 
event. Um, I wanted to thank, to congratulate the Arlington High School graduating seniors who graduated a few weeks ago. Again, just like last year, it was it was a tough year to be a senior in high school and to lose some aspects of your high school experience that you'll never get back. But hopefully, they've all uh, come out stronger and just congratulate them and wish them well on all their endeavors going forward. And then for anyone that went to the ice cream, the Scoop of Mania events on Saturday, it was a little hot, but five to seven dollars for all you can eat ice cream. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was on plan, but my two boys enjoyed it thoroughly with um, ice cream from Abbott's. So that was a great event. But then in the amount of high school students that were there working, volunteering their time, both uh, to work the event and play the music at the event um, on a warm Saturday when they could have been at the beach was yeah. was also very inspiring. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. And I, I also want to uh, um, thank Jill Harvey for the outstanding job she did on, in the Juneteenth ceremony and I um, was happy to be a part of it. And also I want to thank my colleagues, I want to, Mr. Chapdelaine, Attorney Heim, and Ms. Marr um, for coming together for, for this meeting. Um, First one back in the chamber, this, I want to particularly recognize Mr. Helmuth, who um, we attended a few meetings together. He, um, with his knowledge of technology and, and just logistics, he made a big difference in the, in the planning process. I want to thank him for that. And thank ACMI for all the work. Uh, Jeff Monroe has been outstanding. Sean Kane has been outstanding. Just working through some problems. We, we had a practice run last Friday, and there were some issues that we hadn't thought about before, but that were resolved at that meeting. And, and what you saw tonight, I think, was a, a fairly smooth meeting for our, for our first one. So thanks to them and to our IT department for coming up and, and, and addressing issues and, and uh, really working with us. And, and, um, and to Mr. Feeney for getting some new technology yes. in here. So um, thank you. This is where we're going to be. Um, we will be back here on July 19th. So. Um, with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Wait for a second. Second. Okay. Uh, motion's been made and second to adjourn. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. yes. Mr. Helmuth. Oh, yes. Mrs. Long. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Good night, Marie. Adjourned. Good night. Good night. Good night.